it gives me huge pleasure today to be uh, your host and MC for this fantastic session, which is going to take you right around, um, right around Ireland. We're going to go as far south as Limerick, Cork if you include me in Orla actually, um, we go as, in fact, Watford, if we include Orla, I should, I should be, she corrected me on that before now and she was right. Um, and then we're going to go as far north where, as far as Donegal, where Mary McKenna is going to be tuning in. We have a speaker from Galway, we have a speaker from Sligo. We have speakers literally from, from a wide part uh, uh, across the country. So it's, it's going to be a fantastic day. A um, couple of things that I want to take you through. First of all, I want to take you through the broad running order. So, uh, as you can tell, we started promptly. We will finish promptly also from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. today. And uh, the first part of the day is going to be focusing on scale. So we have three really wonderful women who are going to talk to you about their experience of building uh, and executing scale. And we're going to have a great chat with them. That's all going to take place in the morning. And uh, from 10 a.m. until half 11, we're going to take a 10 minute break. And then we're going to bring you back in then for a conversation with a panel of digital influencers. And we're going to take the focus into that whole area of digital marketing and how that has grown over time. After that, then we are going to have three pitchers who are going to be looking for your vote and your vote, the, the fate of these three pitchers and uh, the prize that they are going to have is entirely in your hands. So they're going to have a fantastic prize from, uh, they've got a 750 euro cash prize from Mayo and Roscommon Local Enterprise Office, as well as some mentoring from Grant Thornton. So uh, there's going to be three of them. They are going to pitch for your vote. You're, you will make the decision about who wins, and that's going to take place uh, towards the end of the session. And we are going to finish then, um, finish then, as I say, promptly at one o'clock. Now, lots of social media going on. To be fair to the team in Empower, they have just been fantastic in spreading the word over the past while. So um, what they, uh, please do engage with them. They're at Empower. Dot, uh, dot ie on Instagram, uh, at empower, empowerher.ie, I should say, um, on Facebook, and also empowerher.ie as well on Twitter. The hashtag that we're using for today is hashtag empowerconf. And I am assured that there will be lots of support for anybody who is tweeting and tagging. We will make sure, sure to give you lots of re retweets and, and so on like that. So just, just want to mention that. And of course, we would love to enable digital networking to take place right around the country through this medium as well. So please do, please do participate in, in that way. Okay, now, speaking of this, I just also want to, uh, I just want to try out um, one of the functionalities, because we're going to use most of the functionalities of Zoom today, but what I just want to do is, as you are tuning in now, we have people from literally every, every part of, of the country at this stage, just going to launch a poll, just so that we have got practice at this. The reason that, um, so you can see here now, I've got the poll running. The reason that I wanted to do this so early is so that people have uh, an ability to be able to make sure that you can vote and that you know exactly how to vote when it comes to the pitches, because that is so, so important. We can't let anything, anything go wrong there. So um, I can see 5% of you have voted. Basically, we just want to get a sense, your, your feeling on online networking. How do you feel about it? Do you want more of us when we get to a different normal? Are you quite happy the way it is now? So as you can see, um, there's, I now have 34% of you voting. So I'm really delighted to see that lots of people are well, well used to this function as I anticipated, but we do not want to take any chances when it comes to the pictures later on. So just going to give you a more of a chance. More and more and more of you are joining all the time as I can see here now. 64% um, of you have voted. We're coming up to almost a minute. I'm going to switch it off in 10, Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and here is where I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to stop right there. And let me share the results with you. Is this is what, uh, this is what you're saying. So 32% said love online, easy, on-time global access. 13% of you said bring back the in-person in -person version ASAP. 19% um, of you said going to attend more online events long into the future. 21% of you said that you missed the serendipity of in-person networking. 40% of you, 40% of you are open-minded to a hybrid and that is the winner in this case. 11% of you said, give me the interaction, I'm happy anyway. And 31% of you said, 
online offers much greater flexibility for regional and international networking. So, so it seems to be that it is a mix and, uh, and that's, that's, that's great to see. Great to see, all right, that, uh, that we're, on, we're on the right track here. So what I'm, what I'm absolutely happy with now is that we know exactly how to use the polls, which is going to be super important for later on. Okay, please do post your thoughts into the chat. I am, uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm well able to see there um, that there's there's lots of uh, that there's lots of chat going on. Um, I can see that there's there's people answering each other's questions. So that that's all brilliant. So delighted, uh, delighted to see that. So um, please do keep keep your questions coming. Uh, we're really really happy to to do that as well. Uh, now, I also want to mention that when it comes to posting in a question for the speaker, <coughs> please do use the Q&A pod, okay? So if you, if you just uh, hover on your screen and look down at the bottom, you will see that there is a box for Q&A. So if you click there on the Q&A box, um, please do feel free to post in your questions. And we also have the upvote feature is enabled, so you can also vote in other people's questions as well. We get to all of that when we get to the guest speakers. Um, okay, wonderful. Now, um, so what we're going to do is just before I'm going to bring in Maria to introduce you to the whole idea of what the, today is all about and the rationale behind it, etc. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. And that is I am going to share my screen. Uh, well, sorry, before I'm going to do that, now, I'm just going to go into, into the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a message to everybody. And I'm going to ask you to please click on a link, okay? And this is going to be the way in which we're going to take your feedback at different stages throughout the day. Now I'm going to share my screen as well. So what I just want you to do is just go and to click on the link, okay? So click on the link that I have there in the uh, in the platform. And if just in case you have any issue with that, I am also going to ask you to uh, you can also access it another way. So what you should be able to see now is. Uh, can you just go to menti.com and what I hope that you can see now is that you can see on the code if you go to the top of the screen and you type in the code what I'm just looking to see here is what experience we have in the room today so we have people as I say from right around so um, if you click on the link or alternatively you can go click on the link that I put in the chat or alternatively you can go to menti.com I'm just going to check Maria can you see my screen yeah perfect now, so all I'm looking to do, 17 people right now have actually told, told us where uh, some experience that, that they've had. So you can see that the balls are, are literally coming from all over the country. It is no surprise that I picked green because of the fact that they are coming from all over the country. Now, uh, what I'm intrigued by is we've had 32 responses. I'm looking here, still lots and lots of people joining us. 39 responses now and 11 of you have experience of pushing out your comfort zone. Seven of you have experience of setting and achieving goals. Eight of you say setting and meeting client expectations. Seven of you, just the first person has now voted there to say they have experience of financing their business. Eight of you with digital marketing, eight of you managing people. But what's really intriguing about this group so far is that this is a group that is really used to pushing your comfort zone. And that's going to be a big part of our conversation today. So I'm going to let that run and run in the background. We're going to be um, checking in every now and again. I have, I, have a, I have a question over there for you. Lots more people pushing out their, their comfort zone. 61 of you have voted. <clears throat> and as I said, there's lots more joining all the time. So we're, go we're, going, to be, we're going, going to be leaving that leaving that run there from time to time. But in the meantime, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Maria. And uh, I'm going to put the spotlight on Maria, who is going to tell us all about uh, the Empower program and so on, and the amazing woman that she is. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, uh, Susan. I think I've just lost my screen. I went on to Minty and now I've lost kind of the, the actual screen, but I can keep talking anyway, but just to let you know that. Um, will I keep going? Can you hear me? Oh, we can. We can hear you and see you. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Just to kick off, I suppose, to give people the background about Empower, I'll start there because there are people, I suppose, tuning in today that has never heard maybe of Empower and just to give them the background. Um, so I guess uh, Empower started back in 2016 as an idea um, we there was a call for funding from the Department of Justice and Equality and it was all about female entrepreneurship and we in the IHUBs, myself and George's in the IHUB in Galway and uh, Rick, we, we got together and kind of thought about the female entrepreneurship side of things. We hadn't a lot of females coming through the IHUBs, they were coming through some of the New Frontiers, Tony is on the call there, we had some uh, females coming through but not enough. Uh, more more males than females. So we kind of said, okay, this is something maybe we need to look at more 
Um, so we applied for the funding and thankfully we got it. Um, and then what happened was we, um, we just interviewed some, some females that have been through the centres to ask them of their experience and what they felt was needed. So that helped us to put together a programme and we called it the Empower Programme. And at the time it was run just in Gaul and Mayor Roscommon and we kicked it off there. And uh, if I go back to 2017 or so, we had about 80 people that applied for the first programme. And then in year two, we had 90 people that applied. Um, and overall, this is giving you a quick synopsis, 64 females actually went through the programme. Uh, they, they would have applied and, and um, um, we would have done a selection process and then put them through the programme. Um, and from that, just to again synopsize that, we, uh, what has come from that over the last number of years is there's 130 jobs, 134 jobs have been created by all these females and six part-time jobs. Uh, we have, I suppose, networked them into the college. That's the advantage in terms of the IHUBs. We're connected with GMIT. So what we would have looked was innovation vouchers, innovation partnerships with lots of people would never have heard about. Um, and then looking at pitching for funding and, and also the Network Ireland, I want to mention them later on, the Network Ireland groups um, going forward and pitching at those awards and all that kind of stuff as well. So I guess that's kind of a little bit of the summary of it. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today, just to go back on that, because this event was planned back in April, uh, the end of April. It was meant to be a physical event. <clears throat> we have a little bit of a, a, a group as well this evening getting together to close in Power One. Um, and it was all about coming together and uh, having role models, which are here with us today, and kind of people can tune in and just listen to their experiences. Um, and that has worked well over the years. So thanks to everybody that has, has joined us to, to listen to this. Uh, we're sorry it has to be conducted online, but, but that's just the way it is. But hopefully it will go just as well. And um, I guess just I was thinking back about it over the last few days, things I've learned myself, I suppose, from working with the, the 64 females that have come onto the programme. Um, and certain things have come out, uh, one, I, I give you some examples, but certain pointers, I suppose, inclusiveness was a big thing. Supportive environment is a huge thing working with females. Uh, team playing is a big thing. Um, and I, I give a couple of examples. Confidence was a huge thing. I, I, I suppose I didn't understand it myself. And then, you know, people would talk to me about it and how they developed over time with confidence was wonderful. Balancing life is a huge thing with females, time commitment, family. Um, often I'd sit with some of the females and we, we talk about different things and sometimes it's stuff that's gone on personally um, and even just being able to talk to somebody about that um, or talk to a, if, if, um, another person on the program. So I guess some examples on the program we had, we had one lady that just had a baby four weeks into, I think it was our second program, she's, she's on the call here. Um, and just the, the supportive environment that, that occurred around that, like she'd come along, she was breastfeeding at the time, and the other ladies helping her and, and, and not being judged, you know, by bringing a baby into the room. I thought that was wonderful. Um, another lady talked about pitching, her experience in, in going. Now, this lady is very good at pitching, may I say. Hopefully she's on the call as well. But, um, you know, she used to talk very honestly about how she felt when she'd have to go and pitch. And, you know, she gave us the example one day of arriving in Houston Station and feeling very unwell, having to go to a big pitch that day and get going into the toilets and getting sick and... You know, just sharing that kind of an experience that it's okay to feel like that. A lot of the women would talk about walking into a room as well and the fear of that, which again, it's it's, it's sometimes difficult to understand that, but every, a lot of people understood that fear. Um, and the support and family is a big thing with your, you know, your parents or your, your partner or whatever, you know, having that support at home and telling you to, you know, go for it and, and, and have a go at this. Or, or maybe as somebody said where your mother would say to you, you know, what are you doing setting up your own business? You're a bit mad at the moment. And, you know, getting on, we all get those kind of things. Um, but interesting, some, some pointers as well. Gender is not an issue. I have to say the males uh, in the eye of and, and, and various groups, New Frontiers and stuff, you know, they're very supportive of females. Um, I think women have said it themselves. Often it's ourselves that present the hurdles. You know, it, it, you know we get in our own way, as some of them have said. Um, and it's an inner self-belief. Um, and I think that's quite interesting. I think a big thing with Empower as well is the role models, which we have today. And I'm really looking at <coughs> all the speakers. Um, and I, myself, background, I've, I've played some football. And the, a big saying with football is, if you cannot see it, you cannot be it. And I think that's a big thing uh, with females. And I know Susan mentioned this morning to me, we heard about Maria McGuinness. She'd probably touch on it later. But, you know, seeing people like that, uh, you know, getting, you know, really good roles. Orla's on the call here, president of GMIT. It's wonderful to see 
you know, females that are really climbing the ladder and uh, entrepreneurs on this call today that are, you know, really pushing boundaries. You know, when we can see it, everyone else can feel, I can do that as well. Um, just to kind of say, that, you know, there's plenty more that we have to do. Um, pitching at the moment is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a big thing. Um, so I think being able to see more females uh, getting up and actually pitching uh, in front of audiences is something, you know, I would like to see more of. It's getting better. Also seeing more um, female investors would be, would be wonderful. Um, I know Mary McKenna is on the call here today, and I think that's something she's really plugging, and I'd like to see more of that myself. Um, so they're the kind of things. I know the pandemic was a big thing as well the last number of months, and I, I often wonder myself how much it would affect females. Um, hopefully it hasn't, because I know child minding becomes a big part, big part of, you know, uh, you know, females, and, and, and you know, it's just part of life really, um, or, or could be minding older people or whatever. Often the women take those kind of roles, so. Hopefully it won't affect uh, in the long run and we, we won't let it affect it, I suppose. Um, I think that's kind of like, that's that's my main kind of synopsis of Empower. Sandra will touch on Empower, the new Empower later. Sandra, I want to welcome her on board. Uh, you can't see her at the moment, but Sandra is the new Empower program manager. I've stepped back to the iHub role um, and a wonderful lady and she's really uh, moving ahead with the new Empower program and there's huge demand this year. I think Sandra will touch on it, but I think we've over 200 people at the moment that have applied for the programs. Um, so that's great to see. Um, I want to say a couple of thanks just before I finish off. Uh, Susan, because she, she won't give herself any thanks at all. She is the one that has put all this, this show together. Uh, we're just in the background helping her along, but I want to give her a huge thanks. She's wonderful at what she does and uh, I'm delighted to have her. I said to her, Recently, I would have had many a sleepless nights if I didn't have her on board. Um, I want to give a big thank you to the speakers who have been lined up since April, as I said, well, probably since last January. Uh, Lorraine, Neve, Mary, who are the first three that are on. I can't wait to hear them all speak um, on various different topics. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting hearing them. So thank you to them all for not giving up and saying, I'm not doing it now because you've postponed or whatever. Uh, the three women that are pitching, uh, I have to mention these three ladies, it's Sumter, Marina and Neve. Um, I think I wrote them an email and I said, look at them, kind of picking you three guys. It was just a pick because I could have picked, I suppose, many, many a woman on the program. Just pick them. And I said, please don't say no, because often people say to me, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, but thankfully, the three of them, it's a little bit like I was saying the Richard Branson. If someone offers you an amazing opportunity, you know, you kind of say yes and you think about it and you know you'll do it anyway so thankfully the three of them came back and said yes we'll do it uh, i want to mention brian reynolds i know he's on the call i hope he's tuned in uh, brian has done all the, the the work with the three women getting them ready for for this as well today so big thanks to brian he does huge work here in the center the three influencers as well i have to mention i'm really looking forward to hearing them speak Sinead, uh, charlene and Aoife. I know nothing about the whole world of influencing. So if they teach me something, it'll be wonderful today. I'm, I'm, I'm really behind in all that. Um, just to mention as well, people who have brought the whole thing together for me. So, you know, it's fine saying we had an Empower program, GMIT, we launched it, but <clears throat> the people in the region that really helped us, you know what I mean? I, I remember going out um, and, and kind of meeting people. I know Mary from the Portrait is on the call today, hopefully Neve in the GTC. I remember going out to them and saying, look, we have this program, you know, will you help us promote it? Uh, again, a, a little bit of a saying, it takes a village to raise a child and empower was that child. Um, we had Network Ireland as well. I have to mention them, Galway Mayo was common at the time. I know we have Donegal, Sligo, Leitrim now as well. They really got behind it. The women joined the networks. I think that was wonderful. They've pitched, they've won some awards, um, and they really came in behind the program, which was brilliant. Uh, the local enterprise offices, I cannot not mention them. They have been hugely supportive. Um, Galway, Mayoras Common initially, and as I said, Sligo, Leitrim, uh, Donegal now. Um, and I just really want to thank them because without them as well, it's very hard to do this. I have to obviously thank the main sponsors, the Department of Justice and Equality, uh, the funding comes through the ESF DARA, uh, Nicola and Catherine that are there, they've been hugely supportive, they're always there if we need calls or whatever. Grant Thornton as well, i got to mention them as well because they're uh, giving us, uh, Emer involved in Grant Thornton has given us support as well today. I hope I'm not leaving out, obviously our own team, just to mention the, the <coughs> Sandra I've mentioned, I want to just mention Michelle, who has been mentioned already, and Maura. Uh, and also the IHUB, anybody in the IHUB, George and all the team there as well that gives us help and Tony, uh, thanks to you all. 
Uh, I hope I haven't missed anyone on my own advisory board as well. Again, have been wonderful, the women on that and the, and the guys as well. Um, so if I've missed anyone, I am sorry. It's not intentional. And I hope today is going to be really, really good. And uh, Susan, back to you and Orla. Thank you so so much indeed for for that, Maria. And I think you covered you covered quite quite a lot of ground there. And indeed, it gives me great pleasure now to bring uh, to bring us at, across uh, to the president of GMIT, uh, and that is Orla Flynn. Um, Orla, first of all, you started in the role at a bizarre time. Um, you have got a, a slew of huge entrepreneurship and research and innovation uh, and a wide range of other activities behind you. So I think the future looks very, very bright in Galway and the region more widely. But will you tell us a little bit about your vision for female entrepreneurship and the region's development more broadly? Uh, thanks very much, Susan. Uh, absolutely delighted to be um, joining you here this morning. Uh, I think as Susan uh, alluded in a, in a former role, I was uh, involved in uh, supporting uh, particularly uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, research innovation activities. And uh, I, I started just to let people know, um, I started in, in GMIT, my first day was the 18th of March um, and the lockdown had, had kicked off on the 12th of March. So the, the, the halls were all empty when I started. So it's been a very weird six months uh, since I started, but it's been, it's been greatly heartening to me to see the uh, work being done in GMIT in this area. And again, uh, Maria has thanked everyone, has mentioned everyone. And uh, I, I just want to say that it's, it's been uplifting for me to see the way that the, um, the iHubs are working together in Galway Mayo, and not just in Galway Mayo, but also um, in our Connacht Ulster Alliance partners in IT Sligo uh, and in Letterkenny IT. And I think uh, this really bodes well for um, that deep in embedding within the entire west north northwestern region as we move forward to look to becoming a technological university. Um, one thing that really struck me about this event is the title of the event. So spirit, the, the notion of a spirit of event, I think you've been, you've been holding this uh, event uh, for the last 12 years. This is the 13th year and uh, spirit of entrepreneurship uh, and it's collaborative and I think the idea of the spirit of something really speaks to uh, something within. And I, I think um, it will resonate with many of the participants in the call today. Um, I, I know that there are many, many women on the call and the idea of confidence Maria alluded to as well. Confidence and resilience are so important um, for, for any type of uh, career, but particularly so in, in starting your own business. And I know that nobody's afraid of hard work, but it's all the messy stuff that goes around the hard work. It's the, you know, trying to work with people, trying to bring people along, dealing with all of the other uh, challenges uh, in, in your life, as well as the, the hard work on, on the business. Um, in terms of the confidence and the resilience, I'd also add courage. And for me, and, and I think you referenced it earlier, Susan, uh, the notion of female leadership, very often, it's all about just getting on with your job, working as hard as you can, uh, but, but also putting yourself in a position to gain experience that later on you look back at a particular experience you've had and you say, well, you know, that was something that really stood to me. But at the time, you know, you're not always planning that. So courage to me is always a big thing. And uh, I feel that for, for, for female leadership, very often women need to be pushed over the cliff um, and, and have confidence that, that you will fly. I think as time goes on and as you gain experience and as you gain confidence and resilience, it is like a virtuous circle. Um, you know, you will have more courage to, to jump off your own cliffs uh, in, in the future. And that's really just the message I would like to give people today. Um, I'm looking forward to the day. I'll be with you for the first hour. I have to nip out for another meeting then and I'll be back in, I hope, um, for, for, the, for the closing of, of the meeting. So um, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I want to say a big well done to Maria and all the hard working team uh, in research, innovation and entrepreneurship in GMIT. Thanks again to all of our supporters out there and thanks to you, the participants, uh, and looking forward to a really stimulating morning. So thanks, Susan. Back to you. Thanks a million indeed. I, I, we appreciate that, Orla. And, uh, and particularly as well, it's really wonderful that, that you're going to join us for, for a, a significant part of the day.
So just as we move into the next, uh, the next, um, Finola says, brilliant, so true, confidence is key. So uh, absolutely, it's, it's great to hear that that, that message is, is resonating out there. Um, one of the things that, that we would like to hear from you now before we move, move across to the first of our speakers is, I'm just going to ask you, Again, to go back to, to that link, I'm going to post it again there, but uh, I'm also just going to share, share the screen. And that is that we just want to ask you a question. And that is, how has your mindset changed since the pandemic? So since the pandemic began, how has your mindset changed? It's just a question that we, we'd like to hear. We'd like to hear from, you know, in essence, a big part of the Empower program is all about the, the peer learning and the understanding how people are, are going. And as Orla mentioned, you know, when you are pushed off the cliff and so on. So um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to share the link again, but also you can access it by going to menti.com and putting in the code there that appears at the top of the screen. But also uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to put the link back in there, okay? And I can see, so again, I, as you can see on my screen, you can see as the, as the responses are coming up, you'll, you'll see how they are. So for example, we have people saying they're more resilient, greater work-life balance, taking more initiative in work, networking, really helped me focus and trust my gut. Every cloud is a silver lining, look for the opportunities the new normal presents. Focus on what I actually want to create, not what I've been doing. Um, more likely to take a chance on something, more able to see what's really important, change my direction, open my business, realize I can do it. I'm loving this. God, I have to say, this, is, this really is a great way to, uh, to, to, to start. Uh, I now realize I can do much more than I thought possible. Now that is, that is really, really wonderful to see. More adaptable. After the panic subsided, I start to see it as an opportunity. Uh, more determined as life is too short. So we have well over 100 people now on, uh, on, the, on the call. So there's 29 so far has put in response. I'm just going to give it another minute. And, uh, and then we're going to move across to Mary. Taking brave steps. Open me to new ways of working that really work. Uh, refocus and setting direction. Um, greater work-life balance showed me more opportunities, more worry, mental stress for business have been challenged a lot, but not going to give up. So I, again, you know, please do keep, keep, them, keep them coming in there. There's 39 responses, um, 40 now. Um, and as I said, there's, there's well over 100 people on the call. So it, it'll be really interesting just to see what, what you gather from that. And I think if, if anything, what, what your responses are showing us is the resilience that certainly is in the West. And I know it's a key point that Marie often makes is that really and truly the, the West deserves so much more um, kudos than it possibly gets. The reason for that, I'm an NUI Galway graduate myself. I lived in Galway for four years. And um, often we can see, you know, the West of Ireland being a great place to live and particularly with remote working, how you can have a Dublin job outside, outside of, of Dublin. I, again, as I mentioned, I'm from Cork. You can absolutely have a Galway job. Uh, and there's so many great companies and so many great opportunities. And I was a member of the Galway Business Club. It's where I met one of, uh, one of Maria's advisory boards. And, and I, I lived and breathed the great attitude that there is in Galway. So it's really interesting to see it literally appearing up here on the screen. So please do keep, keep your comments coming in there. We'll capture them all. We'll give them all back to you later on so that you can see. But this certainly would start anyone's day off on, on, on the right note. Now, speaking of uh, starting on the right note, I'm going to go to Mary McKenna. And I can tell that she is tweeting based on the way, <laughs> based on the way that, 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 that she's looking right there. Mary and I go back a long way and Mary and I have had many a phone call where she sits right there in that spot and I can always tell when she's taking a selfie of me or of herself and me on the screen and we appear on Twitter later on. So um, Mary is, has extensive experience of raising funding and um, she was a founder of Learning Pool, a company that began in Derry and that went on to do amazing things. Um, I first met Mary uh, at a business women's event in Belfast actually seven years ago and we've had many, many adventures since. So I know you'll truly enjoy her. You'll have, uh, you're gonna learn, learn an awful lot from her. And, and on that note, Mary, can I ask you to introduce yourself in a much better way than I've done? Yeah, thank you, Susan, and great to be here this morning. Thanks a lot for the opportunity, Maria. Thank you for thanking everybody, Maria. Um, and as you say, it's all about the adventure. You should really only be doing this if it's also a bit of fun along the way, because as Orla mentioned, there's a lot of hard work to be done. So uh, yeah, a bit of fun as well is always nice. So as Susan said, I, I'm an exited technology entrepreneur. I started an online learning business in Derry. 
Uh, I started it with a co-founder and I'm just going to mention how important I also think that is uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, so any of you that are sole founders, um, it's kind of hard on your own because there is so much to do and you may not have all the skills that you need just in one person. Um, we bootstrapped our business. And again, I'll quickly explain that. It means that you don't take any investment. You just grow the business out of the profits that you make. And as you can imagine, that has its own challenges. Um, so I sold my half of Learning Pool in 2014, six years ago. And since then, I've been doing uh, lots of early stage angel investing. I'm usually the first money that goes into um, a small technology business. And what I look for is a female founding team, uh, a project that is doing something around technology for good, so making the world a better place, and something that I can add value to. So I'm conscious about time, Susan, so I will actually just shut up there. And uh, Well, you know. okay, well, one of, one of the things that I personally would, would like to hear, Mary, and I, and I think it, it goes into the essence of, you know, spirit of entrepreneurship, as Orla said, it's about going within. What's the difference between the startup mentality and the scale-up mentality? Because in my own experience, startup is about survival, will this work, you know, early validation, trying to get going, trying to get to revenue, trying to get to profit. But scale-up needs to have a different approach. And how would you describe the difference between the two? Well, I'm going to actually pinch a description from somebody else that I work with. Um, I work with the professor at Oxford University, and he describes this as explore and exploit. And I think that's a good way of thinking about it. So in the startup stage, you are just really trying to find out what your product market fit is and whether or not you've actually really got a business. Um, and as you will all know, particularly the ladies in the audience that have started a business, maybe are already underway with it. Um, most startups pivot. And this is so important that I usually say this twice. Most startups pivot. So there's a couple of like really famous examples of tech companies that have started out as something completely different. Uh, Twitter started out as a platform for podcasting. Uh, Slack started out as a video game. And Netflix, of course, and everybody probably remembers this, started out as a business that used to actually post DVDs out through the mail. And so all of them realized that their product market fit was different from what they thought it was. And so they pivoted. So I think a scale up is where you have found that niche and you realize that you can start exploiting and scaling into it. Um, a lot of startups try to preserve that kind of startup buzz and startup mentality that they have in their team. So they like to stay scrappy and they like to do things quickly, even as they're growing. Um, and I suppose the other thing to say is that don't forget that at the end of the day, the only real advantage a startup has over anything else that's out there trading is speed and is the ability to do things fast. Um, as you grow into the scale up and things become a bit more formal, it's sometimes hard to keep that initial uh, fast pace that you did everything that you did everything like at the beginning. Mary, actually, we've, we've just had a, had a question in here um, that, that I think is, is very worthwhile to put to you at this stage. And that is that how do you find a business partner so that you have someone with you as lots of people struggle with that? Um, I've yeah. had business partners in the past. I'm, I married one, um, which is one way all in Andrew. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. That's a joke. Believe me, if he was on it, he'd laugh himself. Um, but uh, so, so how do you find that business partner? And of course, uh, it's, it's also worthwhile to mention that you have started a new initiative now where you're partnering with people that you've known for a long, long time. I know many of them as well myself. So this is, you're right in the crux of this at the moment. Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky, it's a tricky thing. And I know that uh, Maria and Sandra and whatever will be very conscious about this because I'm sure that they try to do a lot of matchmaking. So you do see accelerators and the likes of the Northern Ireland Science Park run a co-founders program where you can literally you can bowl up there with your idea and hopefully as part of the program, you'll find somebody else that you can join forces with. Uh, so that kind of manufactured way of bringing, you know, of manufacturing a co-founder relationship. Um, for me, my co-founder, we'd worked together before and we already knew each other quite well. 
Um, I suppose, and you will know, uh, everyone on the call will know, there's that whole thing about relationships where there's the storming, norming, um, another thing, and performing, there's another bit that I can't remember there, but if you go with somebody that you know, it cuts out those first few stages and you can just get straight onto, onto the business side of things, you know? It's tricky. It's a, it's a personality thing as well. I mean, you need to find somebody that you can that you can get on with when things are tough as well as when they're easy. Um, and in terms of like a marriage, you probably see more of your business partner than you do of your co-founder than you do of your, of your uh, partner in life, you know? So it's a, it's a serious undertaking. Uh, actually, Andrea, Andrea actually asked a very good question. And please do feel, feel free to, to put your, your questions in there in, into chat or into the q and I'll find them wherever they are. Andrea says, can Mary tell us more about how early is early stage? Do you know, I'm going to give her a terrible answer to this. It depends. Some businesses kind of know what, like, you know, if, you're, if you have a drug discovery business, you're probably never early stage because you know where you're going. You take on millions very, very early and, you know, you blow the whistle and off you go. Other businesses, it does take a while and it, it takes maybe a couple, three years to figure out where you're actually going. I mean, I would sort of say that with software businesses, um, early stage is probably the first two years while you're building product and while you're actually getting ready to launch on the market. Uh, but it really does depend. And Mary, on, on that note, um, there's lots of people here who are uh, Mary and France, I believe it's forming, storming, norming and performing, Mary. Yeah, I just missed out the forming, didn't I? <laughs> um, another, another thing, if we could, uh, and the smiley face came after that from Fran. Uh, another question that, that I think would be really valuable for people here is like, what three piece, what three pieces of advice would you give to people who are fundraising? And I'm not going to pin that down to whether they're actively fundraising, thinking about it wherever they're coming from, what three pieces of advice would you give to people? Yeah, I'm going to rattle through this as quickly as I can because there's a lot in this piece here, Susan. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is start early. Uh, fundraising probably takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take you. I would say that it takes on average probably from you having that first conversation with a potential investor to money being in your bank account in the company is probably six to nine months, but it can be longer. Um, so start way before you think you need to. Um, there's a lot that you can do to get ready. And in terms of finding potential investors and having early conversations with them, you should certainly do that. Um, the main activity, like everything in life, is networking. I mean, that's where it starts, networking and having those early conversations to start making the connections. Um, don't forget that investing is a team sport. And so it's quite, uh, that's why the network is even more important because the people that you speak to may not invest, but they may tell their friends. And the other side of that is that if you find an investor, they may also bring some of their friends in with them. So introductions matter and the networking part of it is really, really key. Uh, the second thing would be to do your homework, decide whether or not you're looking for angel finance or you're going to go a bit bigger and look for a VC because the approaches that you would make would be very different. Uh, so go online as well, look at plenty of pictures, learn about all that jargon to do with investing. You know, it's a really important part of it. Uh, if you're not an accountant, uh, you might want to go and learn about balance sheets and cap tables and learn why they matter to investors. Um, Think about what you want. You know, do you just want money or do you want smart money? Um, think about a realistic valuation for your business and have that already before you go out there chatting to people. Um, don't forget about the angel networks that exist in Ireland. You know, H Band's a great example of, uh, of people that are already there and ready to invest. Um, start working on your pitch deck and your plan early because it will go through a lot of iterations. And I suppose the last thing I'd say on that point is make sure that you've accessed all the free money that you can get your hands on too before you start giving away your equity. Uh, don't forget the EU uh, EIC Accelerator, 2.5 million euro grant. That is a significant amount of money to get your business off to a great start. And it is a grant. And the third thing that I would suggest is that make sure that you raise enough. The process itself is extremely time consuming. It's very distracting for your business as usual. Um, 
at the Awaken Hub event last month, uh, Gillian Doyle from Cerebrian in Donegal talked about her fundraising process. And Gillian says that when she's fundraising, she devotes three days of her working week to chatting to investors and nothing else. So it takes a lot of time and, you know, for you to be in a situation where you've just closed around and you have to start immediately again, try and avoid that if you can. And the last thing I'd say, watch out for the tire kickers. There are a lot of people that will, particularly in the angel investment community, that will have coffee after coffee after coffee with you. And uh, going back to your, uh, your marriage um, suggestion there, Susan, you know, there will come a day when you actually need to pop the question to them and find out if they do want to invest in you or they're just going to carry on having coffees with you forever and a day. That's a huge amount of advice there, Mary. And, um, and there, there, there's, there's comments coming at me from every direction. So please do keep, keep, them, keep them coming coming at me in a way. Uh, so Alton actually puts this point to you and I, and I think it's, it's worthwhile exploring. And that is, um, adjourning is the fifth one, I believe in the, the fifth stage. So um, the partnership might have a defined existence period too. What's your experience of winding down a partnership? Or, I mean, obviously you mentioned about selling your business, but it can all be very exciting to start, but how do you, how do you wind it down and amicably? Well, I have a very short story about this. The, uh, the tax accountant that we did when, we, when I sold my half of the business um, was a very elderly, very wise gentleman. And he'd been a tax advisor for a long time. And he said, that in the 30 years that he'd been doing this sort of work, ours was the first amicable unraveling of a company that he'd ever done. So that kind of does tell you everything that you need to know. You know, it's tricky. Um, it's tricky finding somebody and it's tricky part in company too. So don't ever do any of these things lightly. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. I would, also, I would also add, well, I suppose I'm going to add a comment and you can comment in the comment, is that I often find that in a business partner relationship, you can focus on what would happen if this goes, you know, if the business doesn't go well. But I think an equally valid conversation is what happens if this goes very well. Because if two people are coming at a situation um, from their own businesses or their own stuff going on in their own lives, and then this could take up more than they had initially bargained for. Things might need to need, might need to change a little bit as well. Um, Aoife says, great tips. Thanks, Mary. And Neha um, puts up a question here on the Q&A panel. Uh, just say, can Mary help with lead generation ways uh, for in early startups? So I think, and I, I know I'm interpreting this, but in terms of lead generation, I mean, I know that you are absolutely the queen of networking and that works really well in a business to business scenario, but would you have any, you know, uh, a couple of seconds of an answer on lead generation at an early stage? Um, I, I think there's a lot on this and it, again, it's very much dependent on the sort of business. I mean, most B2B businesses that people are starting, you will already have identified those first few customers and the first few customers, whatever they cost you, you should spend it because you need to have them. Um, B2C is a completely different ball game. Uh, and I think that we'll be covering some of that later today with the influencers or whatever, won't we? Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, if anyone's put any questions in the chat, as soon as I get finished on this part of the call, Susan, I will go in and answer them. But, uh, well, actually, now that you're on that, um, Sumta has put in a question and actually uh, Sumta is one of the people who's going to be pitching later on. Uh, Sumta says, how important is the wording on the contract when the partnership is formed? This may help keep everything amicable when things arise. Yeah. For a business, for a co-founder, mm -hmm. ah, we didn't have anything written down at all. Really? Mm. Okay. Yeah. I have to say, I did now in, in my case. That's interesting. Okay, that's, that, that's, that's great. And um, Mary... You could have, a, as you bring on investment, there'll be a shareholders agreement. Yeah. Um, but if there are only two of you and it's, and it's a 50-50 split, then there isn't really a lot to write down. Um, yeah. I think, you know, just the last point on that whole thing about uh, co-founders, I think if the wheels are going to come off, they'll come off pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. You know, the first, time, the first time that you're under a bit of pressure, that's when the cracks will show. And, and again, the pressure can come if you're overly busy. The pressure doesn't necessarily just come if things go wrong. And that's... that's oh, the pressure will be when you're overly busy. That's the, the word. The pro oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's good. And it's funny because it's in a good problem, but it can be a problem. So, yeah. Um, so absolutely, please do uh, send in. So Mary is, Mary is a panelist, so she'll be able to see your questions. Please do send them in. Um, and just one more thing, Mary, I've, I'm one more minute to ask you, like what pitfalls do you see happening over and over again when it comes to pitching? For again, there's a lot on this, Susan, so I'm 
I'm going to rattle through at pace here. So the first one is uh, when sometimes when people get to me, they've already given away too much equity too early and to the wrong people. Um, so be careful about that because it can either put investors off altogether or it will cause you a lot of embarrassment when you have to perhaps go back to a relative and say to them, my new investors don't want you on my cap table, so I need to ha have my shares back from you and you need to you know, give them some money or whatever for that. So just beware when you start in a business of like not bringing too many of your members of your own family and everything in because it can cause you problems further down the line. Uh, the second point that I have on this is that finding investors is just the first part, really. Then you move into um, what's called due diligence, when they check that everything that you've said about your business is actually true. And I think a pitfall is when founders are going for investment the first time, they maybe don't have all that information ready for due diligence. So it's that stuff that Assumpta was just referring to there. It's your contracts with your customers. It's your uh, share register. It's your minutes of your board meetings. It's your business plan in great detail. Um, in separate chapters, each of them with marketing, finance or whatever, all split out so that when your investors start asking you for different things, you've got it all ready and you can send it out quickly to them. Um, and your forecasts done, your financial forecast done and in detail and you being ready to answer questions in detail about the assumptions that lie underneath those forecasts and being able to do that confidently with investors. And the third one, and this is a bit more sort of esoteric and hand-waving, um, but the change that comes about when you bring investment into your business, so you go from it being something that is very much yours and informal, and it's up to you how you do things, to moving to a stage where it isn't really your business anymore. Somebody else maybe owns a great big chunk of it. You might still be the figurehead, but you have somebody that you're accountable to or people that you are accountable to. And it changes things. It changes the way that things are. And like, don't forget that those investors can potentially also remove you as the chief exec, even if you're the founder, so that you are no longer involved in your own business and you may still have shares and you may still make plenty of money from it. Uh, and so I suppose the point that I would leave you on with there is it sort of links back to your reasons at the start for starting your business. You know, what is it that you are looking for? Why are you going down the investment route? Is it to build something bigger and sell it and to make lots of money? Or are you starting a business because it's something that you're really interested in and you want to do it forever? So those are my tips. Thank you. Mary, they're brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And um, Darius has great advice, Mary. Class. <laughs> um, so there is, there is lots. Now, I have just posted up your Twitter handle there on the chat if people want to reach out to you. Now, I've also, I, I'm, deter I'm deciding whether I should actually post this or not is anyone who wants to reach out to Mary, okay, I'm telling you from, from the chats we've had over the years, do not send her a blank invite. She can't stand them. So if you are going to reach out to her, Make sure, make sure that that, that 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 you mention why. And I've just just put that piece of that piece of advice up there now. Mary, thanks so much. You're going to come back to us, of course. You're going to be with us for the morning, but you're going to come back to us during the pitches. And um, so we're, we're going to hear more from you then. And in the meantime, please do reach out to her. She's super, super, super uh, full of advice. And thanks so much indeed, Mary, for joining us so far today. Thanks, everybody. Now, Lorraine is up next. So, Lorraine Heskin, um, the woman behind the Gourmet Food Parlour. Now, because I'm extremely dedicated to this job, I took it upon myself last Saturday to go out to one of the Gourmet Food Parlour's restaurants for brunch. Now, it was solely because I really felt it was a requirement to do this to make sure I could really interview Lorraine properly. And I have to say, Lorraine, a truly delightful experience. I went out to John Leary great food. I actually met my brother who's, um, he's an engineer, told him you did the interior design yourself and I asked him for his comments, double thumbs up Lorraine. So, <laughs> so maybe could you tell us um, in, in your story of, of Gourmet Food Parlour, what motivated you to set up your own business? 
Thanks very much, Susan. And uh, good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure for me to be here this morning. I'm so delighted to be asked. And Maria, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And Susan, thanks for all your hard work. And it's been a pleasure working with you so far on this wonderful occasion. Um, so my name is Lorraine Heskin. I am the founder and CEO of a business called Gourmet Food Parlour, specifically located in Dublin, but I'm very proud to have a restaurant in Salt Hill and Galway, which I'm just out the road from originally uh, from a little village called Barna, if anyone knows it so that was definitely one of my proudest moments opening a restaurant in Galway two years ago. I think what inspired me to open my business was very much um, uh, I suppose reliant on a stint that I spent in, in America after I graduated from um, my postgrad in business in the University of Limerick I went to work for IBM and then following that um, I, I kind of had the, the itchy feet and I, and I decided to, to take my travels to, to New York in America 2001 and I was very lucky to have um, a fantastic experience in my early 20s I was very much like loved my work loved my career and I was very career focused um, so I got to work for for some fantastic companies. I primarily started as a um, working in a food business, so an Irish and English import food business in New York, which was absolutely brilliant. So we were representing Irish brands in in, in America and then selling them to the retailers, the brokers, and the and and the, um, and, the and the warehouses. So that was a brilliant experience for me, and I worked my way up to sales manager there. And then I became a consultant um, for specialty food, still working on the Irish and English food brands, but working with with domestic brands as well. And part of that job was traveling all throughout the states and 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 entertaining clients and visiting lots of beautiful restaurants which I was very lucky to be able to do um, and I always loved the experience of going into a restaurant and having an atmosphere and a beautiful welcome and how are you and how's your day and this is our specials today and nice wines and the combination of it all together was something that always always intrigued me in, in, inside and, and at weekends I used to walk into Manhattan and I'd, I'd check out the suburbs and I'd look at restaurants and delis and places like that so so when I moved back from from New York I went to work for Jacob's Biscuits which was a brilliant brilliant time for me but throughout that time I suppose what it kind of felt was I had this itch and, and anyone who wants to set up their own business it, it, I think it's all individual you kind of have this feeling inside you're thinking I love my job and I love what I'm doing but I'm just not quite there yet I'm not quite content with what, what I'm doing and I always kind of knew that if I didn't do it then I'd never do it so um, I suppose I started the whole concept of maybe opening a deli and a cafe and, and something small, starting small. And I thought, what would the brand entail? Because the brand is always so important to me. So when, when I always look at Gourmet Food Parlor, I think I want customers to know, OK, well, yeah, I've heard of them. or That's a fabulous brand or they have a beautiful restaurant and I love what they do or the atmosphere is great. The, the, the positivity resonating from it. So I started working on the brand concept straight away and... This was 2006 when, if everybody remembers 2006, it was back in, in the real, real striving Celtic Tiger times, as they call them. Um, and every landlord in, 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 in Dublin practically said no. Like every time I tried to get a premises, it was like, no, 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 no. But I found one fabulous landlord who, who gave me a chance. His name is Bob Reed. And I said this to you before, Susan, I'll never forget him ever as long as I live. And he gave me a chance. And that's how Gourmet Food Parlour started. Yeah, it often comes down to, you know, to, to, to that one person that can often open a door and, and are just as, as Mary has mentioned here, like, you know, leap and, and an will form. Well, I have to say you have some serious fans here um, because uh, Jackie says I had a great experience in the Galway Gourmet Food co uh, Company recently. Um, then Sandra said, what an addition to Saltill Lorraine's restaurant is. Ashling said the joy of finding Tato in New York City after five months. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I hear that. Yeah, I hear yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and you. Know, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. All right. Just how you say um, everything that you said about the positivity, the great atmosphere, the food, particularly the way the window looks out onto the water there in Dunleary. And by the way, I'm going to make it my personal mission to get around to them all, all <laughs> six of them. <laughs> So, so one of the things, though, that that uh, that you mentioned there, uh, like at the start of your story, is, is taking that risk for the first one. But of course, you are now in Santry and Malahide and Scarries, you know, in Salt Hill and so on. Uh, just interestingly, um, Lorraine, as as my brother and I walked out of the restaurant, uh, a car or a van passed us, which said Gourmet Food Parlor Catering as well. So mm. I, I really saw the full experience. So how do you how do you manage risk? How do you manage risk when it comes to taking the next step? 
towards whether it's a new restaurant, whether it's a new part of the business, whether it is a new part of the country? How, how do you manage that? Or, or what do you think through when it comes to taking risk that way? And, and that's, a, that's such a brilliant question. And I'll, I'll probably answer from how I used to manage it back in 2006 when I decided, when, when we, I opened the first cafe and I realized, I always say this, that there was a demand for the brand because when you open your business first, you know, you're nervous and you're, you're apprehensive about what's the future going to hold and are people actually going to believe, I mean, I believe in it so much, are people actually going to believe in it as much as I do? Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing when you, when you start your business. And I remember in 2006, the day we opened, it was 1 p.m. on the 28th of July, 2006, and I'll never forget as long as I live and I was as nervous as the day was long, but we were so busy I probably didn't even have time to be nervous but but a queue was outside the door because we had started a small element of marketing and again that brand concept I'm always talking about how important your brand is to your business and there was a queue out the door and and I was I'll never forget as long as I live there was there was people who believed in it and then you get that adrenaline buzz and then you start your business and you focus on it within six months to a year I kind of realized that there was that there you know that I was going to open more I wanted to, I had the energy. I still have the energy for it 14 years later, but I, I knew that there, was, that there was going to be more. So what I used to do then, very, very simply was, because it's a restaurant business, we're in the food game, I used to look at potential premises or I'd research all around and I would literally sit in a car and then I would look at the, the, the pedestrians on the street, the buses, how many buses are coming by, and then I would check the corporate. So for me, I, I've, I've established and grown my business by hashtag what I call not being on the high street. So I have not taken huge rents in city centre towns or cities. I have, I have developed the brand to be able to I suppose entice people to come out of their way to visit Gourmet Food Parlour because that's if you look at every single restaurant we're not on the main street anywhere yet yeah, we've, we've gone to six well we've had seven restaurants I've just recently closed down one and we have a catering and event business as well so assessing risk is it's is such a broad um, question is or such a broad answer as well Susan but I mean look at I have to look at everything you have to look at the area what are the potential income what's the corporate income um, because you can't just rely on residential when you're opening a restaurant or in the food business you need you need both to be able to survive because the days that are quieter you can focus on maybe corporate business to be able to come in for lunchtime so you have to focus on all of that and then also you have to look at the unit as well what investment is needed what's the landlord like or the deals what's the terms on the lease you know how much how much money is, is is going to be required to fit it out to standard so there's all of those elements that, that need to be assessed and at the end of the day the biggest risk there's always a risk in, in doing everything in business and, and even changing things within your business is a risk but you have to believe in it you have to believe in yourself you have to believe in what you're doing and, and Mary alluded to this as well running your own business whether you have business partners or not it is a very very it can be very very lonely space and you know surrounding yourself with good people is such a pivotal part of it as well and it helps you sometimes when you can bounce your thoughts and your ideas off other people and particularly people outside your business so networking is key and having people that you trust close by you assessing the risk that you think you're going to take you know you, you take what they say on board and you think okay I'm going to take that on board I'm going to think about that for a couple of days and you let it sink in sometimes what they say you mightn't take it on board but other times you might say you know what they're right and it's listening it's, it's getting that sound advice so it's all of those parameters kind of combined together and then just that belief in yourself and you have to take a chance sometimes you know well, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued actually by, by what you're saying about being a lonely space because I just posted your Instagram uh, up there on the, ch on the chat. Um, I, I've discovered it pretty well myself over the last while. And like Brian, Brian Reynolds here, for example, he said, entrepreneurship is a team sport. There's no room for the Lone Ranger. Lorraine Bowen says, I was a big GFP fan years before I met Lorraine. Her authentic, enormously generous support of female entrepreneurship drives me back to the brand whenever I can. And that's, uh, that's uh, sorry, there's look, look, Thanks, I can keep going here. Um, the ambition is just wonderful to see. I can only imagine how exhausting this can be, but your energy, Lorraine, is to be admired. Love the enthusiasm. Assessing risk is so important. Now, what I find intriguing about your Instagram is I know more about your mother and your father. <laughs> your kids, and I, I also, and they look very well that night. You brought them to the, to the, car, to the awards <laughs> <laughs> and all the rest of it. But you know, you know what, what particularly strikes me though is the, is the day you posted that you had a hundred jobs and then there was the yeah. cupcakes. Like I literally know it all, Lorraine. I'm really, <laughs> truly, really you know, so ch check, check that out on, on Instagram. But the thing is, you, you like, we'll say multiple areas. Um, a restaurant with, with one, I suppose, an idea of one brand 
So how do you build a culture across different venues, but in one company? Like, because that, that is something that anybody who is involved in scale or particularly multiple venues will know. Culture has to be right. And, and how have you done that? So culture for me is, is, is just vitally, vitally important. And, and I suppose what I did, Susan, a few years ago is when we started with one cafe and then we decided, to, I decided to kind of grow the business. Um, you know, pre-COVID, we had close to 300 employees um, and, and COVID is a separate conversation because it's been very, very difficult, but we've been able to, we've been able to transition through, which I'm very, very grateful for. But, but the culture in the business, it, it, you know, the responsibility lands on me. I'm, I'm the top tier and it comes from me down. So so if I feel that someone has left the business or something negative has happened, I take that very, very seriously. And what I did a few years ago was I worked with a business consultant to help me to step outside the business and to look from outside within to, to see, OK, how can I set up the business so I can absorb growth, but I can also maintain what I want to be a happy culture. Um, and we all know some of us have good days, some of us have bad days. If you're in a busy environment, things are going to be challenging. But I always say it's how we deal with it as a team. We're all there to support each other. And there are always solutions. I always say there's three solutions to everything. So let's let's talk out the three and let's pick the one that we want to go forward with. But at the time, I developed and devised a structure within. Oh, Lorraine, um, I think we might just have a, I think she's, she's possibly just, just dro dropped off there. And um, what I'm just going to do at this stage is just point out um, that uh, Asunta has also said it's, it's so important to be open to advice, but also being able to filter. Lorraine, I think we can, we can hear you. Do you know what's after happening now is that they're telling me that Zoom has undetected my camera for some reason. Okay, well, let me see now what we can do. About anyway, you're probably better off not looking at me. I'm probably better off just talking. Anyway. Far, far from it. Far, far from it now, all right. Um, okay, I'm not sure how we can handle that one right now, Lorraine. What I can do is I can, what I might do is that I might just, just pop across to Neve and then we'll bring you back in for, for, for the Q&A. Do you know, there's, there's do know what I can do? So, sorry, Susan, I can link in here. Um, on, on, on my phone. phone. Can you can you hear me now? I can hear you twice. One second. Okay, now. Okay. Well, let me see. What I'm going to do is... It's, it's, it, just says that, um, it just says that the, uh, that the host has disabled the camera. So that might help. Yep. There you go. Okay, now. So if you just switch on your camera there. Now we're right. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry oh. about that. Um... So yeah, so look, at I mean, I devised, uh, I suppose, what, what I call is like a structure within the business. So what's really important to me is that everybody, everybody works within their own departments. So within the business, we would have um, a marketing, marketing and uh, communications department with a graphic designer. We would have a business development and catering section. We have an operations team that run the core operations of the day-to-day -day business. So they would be in charge of all the head chefs all the managers, um, all the way down to kitchen porters, waiters and waitresses on the floor. Everybody, everybody is involved um, in that. Then we have a full finance team. So it allows me to manage all the different departments and all the different areas. And, it, uh, and then it allows me to, I suppose, communicate and keep in touch. And most specifically, we have a HR department. Um, and last year we invested in the most amazing online system called Flow. It's, it's a Scottish training system. And it allows us then to encourage every single staff member to, um, to become educated and to continue training and to develop their training. And then for staff who are starting to work with Gourmet Food Parlor, they must carry out different modules before they start. So it's developing all of that culture together. Um, I mean, I, I pride myself on, on knowing everybody and going around and having a positive environment. Um, positivity comes from the managers, so we stay in touch with them and that, that will, that will divide down to, to their teams as well. So it's very, very important. And it is difficult as you, get, as you get bigger, there's no doubt about it, but I think you need to adapt. I think you need to change your business at all times and be open to change, to know how important it is to continue to keep that culture moving forward. And it's not always gonna be successful because we all know there are going to be challenges, but I think I always learn more from making mistakes or from getting feedback from somebody who's upset for some reason, then I know where the problems are and then I feel good about it because then I can do something about it. So it's very important to me that I continue to, to change and continue to, to keep growing in that essence. Well, I, I'm just, just going just gonna to read out a range of things that have, that have come into me here. Um, so uh, Francis, love this Lorraine, happy culture, look from the outside within. 
Um, then also, uh, Jackie said, Staff Joy was the most striking and notable part of my visit to the Gourmet Food Parlour recently in Galway. Great food too, of course, but I was particularly struck by the staff vibe. Um, uh, then also, uh, some said it's so important to be open to advice, but also being able to filter. Lorraine is so inspiring. Uh, Petra says, I'm a hospitality professional. I'm in awe of Lorraine and her business culture. Septa said Lorraine is a fabulous ambassador for the wonderful culture she's harnessed in GFP. It's so important. That's with two O's. Uh, and GFP is cruising with it. Lizzie said exuberant passion for Lorraine. How important is passion in building your business? Oh, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant question because I tell you, it's so important. And I feel honestly so blessed that 14 years later, I still am as passionate and, and absolutely in love with the business. As I, as I was 14 years ago. And, and like, like running any business, having your own business is very, very tough. And it is the good days that keep you going because there are bad days and we all have to be realistic about that. But I think it's so important because I think people will get that from you. When you have that love and that passion and you can feel it from somebody, I just think there's nothing better than feeling that. And I think that actually inspires other people around you as well. And I think positivity, positivity like even today, hearing, hearing everybody talk this morning and, and and throughout the day, you're going to, we're going to leave today going, I just feel amazing. And I'm so glad that I was exposed to this person or that person, or I got, I got energy or I got inspiration about maybe making changes in my own business. So I think that, that I think that passion is really, really important. Well, Lorraine, thank you so much indeed for joining us. So we've, we've, we've lots more questions that I'd love to ask you, but we're going to bring you, bring you back in again before the break. Um, thanks so much indeed. It's huge. You've, you've really great factor, as I say. Um, I also, uh, Lorraine is also a panelist. So if you have any questions, uh, one last thing, uh, Maureen says, recruitment and retention in action as a hospitality recruiter, it's refreshing to hear how an employer is caring for her employees. So, so lots of fans and you definitely got one of me anyway, uh, for, for, for sure. <laughs> Thanks so much indeed, Lorraine, and for persevering as well uh, for, she oh, said, you're a problem solver. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to bring in Neve McKenna. Uh, so Neve McKenna comes from... Um, a spot, or, sorry, I was going to say spotlight. That's because I've turned on your spotlight. You come from Change X. Now, um, actually, Neve and I have a mutual friend who introduced me to the whole concept of Change X. It's a fantastic platform that really enables people to be um, to create their own social entrepreneurial or social enterprise tech um, uh, capabilities and activities. And, and even if it's nothing to do with enterprise, if it's simply being wanting to be the change that that, that you want to see around the world. So, Neve, first of all. Um, first of all, you're very welcome. Again, would you like to introduce okay. Change Change X and a little bit to us, and uh, and then we'll we'll ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, so my name is Neve McKenna. I'm from Donegal, but I uh, went to college in Galway, so definitely have the strong connections to the West. I'm in Dublin today, but yeah, so we started Change X about six years ago now almost which is kind of crazy but the problem that we set out to solve was that within the kind of social innovation or nonprofit sector ideas that work often struggled to scale so that you had this kind of reinvention of the wheel and um, so as people tried to address social problems um, people didn't know that there was a solution that already worked in maybe another country or another region of a country. And at the same time, you had people in local communities looking for ways to improve things or get involved or solve a problem. So we wanted to bring those two things together. And how we did that was we want, tried to build um, a technology platform where you had proven solutions on one side and people looking for ways to, to help or solve a problem on the other side and um, so we've been through lots and lots of iterations of that and it has evolved in kind of many different ways but that's still the core of it so it's all about scaling ideas that work so some of the ideas that people will be familiar with here are things like grow it yourself which is an irish organization which brings people together to grow their own food and um, another one is repair cafe an idea that originates in the netherlands and brings people together to fix things <laughs> rather than throw them away um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about ChangeX. Well, what intrigues me about ChangeX, Neve, is the fact that in contrast to specifically Lorraine's business and, and even in, in, in Mary's initiatives is you're enabling people to be stakeholders in something that they're not employees. So you still have to mm. motivate and influence and, you know, incentivize and so on like that. 
And as just as you mentioned, where the barriers to scale are the very things that, that you want to remove. So how do you build a team? How do you build an ethos where you can't, like Lorraine can do, say, walk the floor? Um, how, how do you do that? How have you, how have you built that over the past six years? Yeah, so yeah, it's an interesting question because so Change X is, I suppose, there's kind of many different elements to it. So obviously there's the core team and then there's our kind of team of teams, as we call it, which are our, like our board, our advisors. And then we partner with a lot of other nonprofit organizations. So the likes of GIY have been, you know, a very close partner of ours since we started. We get the opportunity to work with many great social entrepreneurs from all over the world. So that's kind of another team and then like you said we're kind of trying to empower and enable people in local communities to take these ideas and get them started and support them through that process through an online platform and um, so initially we did that in a very kind of a manual way like we we actually kind of piloted change x um, in a community in the burren with a great social entrepreneur down there brendan dunford and um, so we spent the first few months like going down to the burren meeting with local community leaders uh, we printed out guides for how to start ideas like it was so so manual um, and it was kind of through building that local team down there and really learning what was valuable what was completely not valuable at all that we then went on to kind of build the technology platform and really just start scaling some of these ideas and you know i think we're still in that kind of scaling journey like we've cracked elements of it um but that building out that team of teams has really been so critical and i think people a few people mentioned you know the importance of commitment of passion of resilience and uh, particularly within our core team that has been so critical over the last few years that you know so we are a nonprofit, so it's i think our mission and kind of what we want to achieve is probably the thing that attracts people and um, to our team and you know some of our kind of early philanthropic investors have been there the whole way through and kind of supported us through this process as we tried to become a more sustainable um, non-profit organization with a revenue model that could sustain us uh, to really get to the kind of global scale that we want so i think yeah, there's kind of many teams involved, so it's a it's kind of a complex web of teams. Well, the, the the I'm sure there's lots of people today. As I say, we have we've well over a hundred people today on on the call throughout, and I certainly know in my own case anyway Eve, that there's times when you hit ceilings and you want to get to the next level, but if you continue to do the things you've always done, you will get the things that you've always got. So mm -hmm. just like you say, the whole idea of Change X is ideas that work can be hard to scale. So if you were to identify some of the key ideas that enable things to scale or the barriers that if you remove them that then can move forward like starting off that day in the burren and printing flyers and so on like that and understanding what's valuable and what's not valuable but how do you how do you get to multiply that by 10 or 100 um which of course change x is is, is all about yeah so there was a few kind of critical points for us i think and just looking back on the last few years i think one of them was that initially we were, I think, to be honest, we were guilty of kind of trying to scale a bit too early. Uh, we hadn't really reached product market fit or we didn't have that, um, that kind of sustainable business model that was going to allow us to scale. So although we were growing, we weren't doing it in a sustainable way. So our kind of key metric at the time was active starters. So um, an active starter is someone who's taken one of the ideas from ChangeX and got successfully got it started in their local community. Um, so we could see that that was growing, but we weren't becoming any more sustainable as an organization. And um, so we had to switch our key metric to like kind of sust sustainable active starters or where we were also growing as an organization for each time we had um, an active team get one of these ideas up and running and that was a ha really hard transition to make and a hard yeah we had to be kind of very honest with ourselves that you know we could like hit ourselves that we were growing but really it was only going to bring us so far and that was really us kind of getting to that product market fit so that we had paying customers so we partner with corporates or foundations who actually fund both us and that local team in a local community who's starting one of these ideas. So it wasn't really until we made that transition that we were even ready to really talk about scaling. 
Um, so I think that was that was a, a kind of a big key transition for us. And then I think, yeah, the, when you said you kind of get to a point, you're like, oh, how are we going to get to the next level? And uh, for me, that was very much happened last year when we closed a partnership with Microsoft, which was so what Microsoft were struggling with was so they do an awful lot of work as many people will know, and environmental sustainability, but they were struggling to really kind of engage at the grassroots or local community level on their environmental sustainability projects. Um, so we got introduced to them through a mutual um, connection and we were going to do a pilot with them in two regions of the US, so Arizona and Chicago. So we decided as a the team and the board that we were going to kind of try and do this totally remotely but if needed we'd just go over there and like get someone on the ground uh, similar to how we started out in the burn or how we did had done some of our work here in Ireland and um, so that was definitely pretty daunting and we went through kind of a whole as a team we looked at actually one of the things we looked at and someone already mentioned this story of Airbnb but we really looked at the Airbnb story in a lot of detail and there's some great resources out there on how they scaled their kind of magical experience. Um, so, you know, doing things that don't scale initially, trying to build out a seven star user experience. So we kind of went through that whole process in order to figure out how we were going to do this in the US, how we were going to activate 50 teams around um, environmental ideas without actually being there and really kind of leaning our, on our technology product and really scaling the things that we knew would work and had worked here, there. Um, so I think that that was also another big, so really kind of focusing on the user and really understanding like the value that you're bringing and kind of how you can begin to bring that to scale. So um, that was another point of, of big learning for us over the last few years. And, and could I could I ask you in in that case you well you've you've partly answered it when when I mm. say what you need to stop doing by you need to stop focusing on certain metrics or KPIs or indicators and move to others. Are there any behaviors mm -hmm. that that you need to change? Is there is there maybe it's a mindset behavior? Maybe it's a way in which you talk to each other? Maybe it's a you know a certain language? Yeah. Behavior. What, what do you need yeah, to stop doing to scale? Yeah, there's definitely a few. Like I, I suppose because we had, you know, there was definitely things that we had done in a very kind of manual way and processes that we had designed. And, you know, you really need to kind of let go of some of that stuff that's not going to serve you as you scale. And, you know, we work as well with a lot of social entrepreneurs who are kind of going on this journey. Um, like Tracy Kyo from Grow Remote, who, who many people might know. I've kind of worked with her over the last few years on she was starting out like how do we begin to scale this chapter model so together we were like okay what are the really core principles of what a grow remote chapter is and then how do we like let that scale in an organic way without having too much control and um, I remember GIY like McKelly always tells the story of when he started GIY he was going around to all the GIY meetings around the country um, for their first event and you know as that scaled he realized that he just couldn't couldn't do that anymore but tr and I think there's so much we can do now that we can retain those kind of that personal uh, touch without the actually going around the country so I think GIY did like a welcome video or things like that so I think there's kind of letting go of things and really just focusing on what's critical to my idea like what really makes this work and therefore will will get it to scale and on I, I also wonder if we could really niche down this, like what's the biggest challenge mm. that ChangeX has had so far? Um, has it been, you know, ha, well, I suppose actually it goes, it goes back to the conversation we are just having there with Mary, which is, did the challenge come from almost too much success at any one stage? Did it come, where, where did it come from? What, what, where has the challenge like, been and how to overcome it? I think our biggest challenge, and it's an ongoing challenge, is is building a sustainable revenue model. And um, so we, you know, started out with purely philanthropic funding from mostly individual philanthropists who kind of could see the potential in applying uh, and using a technology platform to spread social innovations. But that was only ever going to get us so far. And we experimented with different revenue models. Like we always knew we didn't want to charge 
the people who were starting ideas in local communities because that wasn't what it was all about. We actually did experiment with charging the social innovators, so the the kind of nonprofits that we worked with, but like they don't have much money either, so <laughs> that was never going to get us very far. And we we were just really bad at even trying to ask them for money because they just didn't have it. So then it wasn't until we really started to hone in on well what is our value proposition uh, particularly for corporates like where are they struggling with whether it's a CSR strategy or an environmental sustainability strategy and what can we offer them that is unique and therefore that we can begin to build a sustainable revenue model out of it and um, so that has definitely been the biggest biggest challenge for us and we're still you know we are our Microsoft is growing, which is great. We have some other um, smaller partnerships with Target in the US and Niantic, a gaming company in the US. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're kind of like learning and kind of growing that that model. Uh, but that has definitely been our our biggest challenge, and and now just growing that and sc scaling that right up um, is is the next one. Well, I think, I think, Niamh, you know, I think we've an awful lot to see yet from ChangeX and I think it's, it's going to be intriguing and, and thank you so much, Niamh, for, for sharing your insights with us. And um, it, I now have, have the opportunity to bring, um, to bring all of our three speakers back, back together. So while, while we're doing that, what I have now done is that I'm just going to ask you to go back to, um, back to the link that I mentioned from earlier. And can I now just ask you, what key takeaways did you glean from the speakers? While I'm doing that, I'm just going to ask Mary, and Lorraine and Neve, just to turn on your mics and to turn on your video, please. So um, again, I'm just gonna, gonna go back up there and I'm going to get the link and I'm going to make sure that everybody has access to it. So what I'm, what I'm now gonna ask, ask you to do is just, if you just pop in the key insights that you have picked up from this morning, what it allows us to do is number one, is we can share them with, with everybody else. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, number one, we can share them with everybody else, but also I'm going to ask the speakers to actually comment. Um, there's one anyway has come up, Be Confident, Leap and Annette will form one that came from, from Mary and Orla this morning. Um, so I'm just going, to, uh, just going to copy the link here again, copy that, and I'm going to paste that. Um, so the importance of passion and determination uh, in business, brand is key. Nailing your product market fit, Neve. That's that's yours. Um, so I'm just going to just going to give you a moment here. So the importance of your brand to your business demand for your brand. Most startups pivot. Be flexible. That's one from you, Mary. Um, that one has just appeared there again. So please do pop them in. It's always good to do this just to hear what is it that you're picking up from everybody, but also maybe. Um, we are aware, of course, that things can happen while things are online, and something may catch your your attention for a moment. And we really do have great, great, great people here. We're going to have lots more great people after the break. So I think it's, it's just a good idea to be able to um, capture the insights that people have. Um, Emma here says, resilience is key. Don't give away equity too early. Another one from you there, Mary. Always be ready to pivot. Passion is key. Always be open to advice and looking at your business from the outside. That's from, one from each of you. Well done to that person. So there's 25 comments in there. Um, please, do, please do keep continue to, uh, to, to, to pop them in. Um, and uh, they're, they're going to appear on your own screen. So just because I stopped sharing doesn't mean that it, that it stopped there at all. But what I'm, what I'm just going to do, um, maybe Mary, if we, if we just, just go back to you, I'm just going to cancel the spotlight video and, uh, and um, uh, just make sure, Mary, that you're, uh, that you're there. Perfect. And also, um, Lorraine, if I could ask you to do the same, you might just turn, turn back on your video, please. It just um, says, sorry, Susan, it just says it, that it's locked, that the host has locked it. Can you unlock it maybe? Oh, yep, I can indeed. I have that done, done there, there right. for you now. So if you, yep, Thank perfect. You. perfect indeed. Okay, so, so Mary, in terms of like what you're seeing on the chat, what you're hearing other people say, what's appearing up there, loads and loads and loads of comments are continuing, 36 comments up there now on that. Um, what do you think, Mary, is the, uh, is one of the, the, the key, the key things that you feel people are taking away from you this morning? I think that they, um, our audience today, will really think about whether or not taking finance and investment is the right route for them. I've seen a few people saying that uh, it's made them reconsider whether it's the right path. And it's something that very much, uh, even the government and all of its agencies 
encourage you to do. Um, there is a policy around encouraging people to take investment into their business for whatever reason, but it's something that you should think, you should think long and hard about it. Yeah, I see Christine here has said, I've learned from Mary that I definitely don't want investors. I started out to work for myself and pivoting is what I'll, what I'll be open to. That's coming up a lot here on, on my screen here to the left, which is where I have that, all of your comments coming in, is that um, pivot, like the ability to pivot um, is, 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 a, is a huge thing. That's something that's really coming up there. And Lorraine, I have to go to you on this because of course the world and its mother wants to know how you handled COVID. And I know COVID is, you know, <laughs> potentially, um, you know, uh, sorry, not potentially, it's, it's a current thing as opposed to how did you, um, but how, how have you, did you have to pivot? How did you handle that? I think a lot of people would be interested in that, Lorraine. Yeah, massively, massively, Susan. I mean, probably uh, March the from March the 12th to now, my, my business has completely taken a 360 degree turn. Um, first of all, I decided it was very early to close down uh, the whole business um, because I just felt that there was a, there was a sense of, um, unrest and people were very nervous not just customers but staff and I just felt at the time because there wasn't enough knowledge about COVID that I took the decision to close which was a very 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 difficult decision to make but it was the right one all the same so after that it was quite scary because I didn't know how long is this going to last for you know are we going to be six months 12 months what, what's the story and I've got landlords and rents and I've got suppliers and staff and you know, you have to manage everything all together. So uh, I took a day, took a day to have a think about it. And I woke up two days late. Well, two days later, I took two days to think about it. And I decided to open for takeaway. So basically what we did was I went from having seven restaurants at the time. I now have six and a, and a, and a thriving catering and event business. We specialize in sports nutrition. So we work with top athletes throughout the country um, and teams, Dublin teams, Leinster, Rugby, Connacht Rugby, all of those co um, companies combined. And what I decided was to, to shut it all down. So we started to open very, very slowly. Um, and, and it was a very much, a, a very much a pivot. And that's such a brilliant word because we had to completely pivot. So basically no, nobody could ever order any of our food online. So we decided to invest in, a, in an online platform uh, to, for customers to be able to order and collect or we would deliver. So what I did is I took my 14 vans that were in my catering business and I put them on the road delivering to houses. So I was able to keep jobs going. I was able to keep the brand alive and I was able to keep the business going at a very much a smaller scale. But that's how we started. And the first couple of weeks were quiet. Then it started to build momentum and customers contacted us and said, how can we get this and how can we get that? So I eventually, now this is a very, very long, short version of a longer story, but I eventually got all six outlets open and we put a huge amount of work into retraining staff. Again, our online flow system that we invested in last year proved to be absolutely essential to us. Um, we reduced our seating capacity in every restaurant from 30 to 40 percent. We bought in Perspex screens. I hired a man to, to make the screens for me and paint them the same color as the decor. So the decor wasn't to be, wasn't to be hindered, but... Yeah, look, at, we just adapted and, we, and we, we fought and we fought hard and we kept everything going, you know, and, and it's, been, it's been a journey. It's been a huge journey, but I'm so grateful to be sitting here and to still be able to, to have our six restaurants open and I can see the love for, for the business and that makes everything so worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, you just keep, you know, oozing that passion that, that everybody is, is, is describing uh, for sure, Lorraine. And I didn't realize, of course, when, when I went into your restaurant, I didn't feel like it was at a different capacity. It just felt, just felt great. Yeah, that's <laughs> to, good. Yeah, which that's is, I, I know, ultimately, um, ultimately what, what, what you'd like. Uh, Niamh, um, uh, sorry, to be, Niamh, can I bring you in here? But just, just before, uh, Lorraine, so inspirational, Lorraine, the staff retraining is key uh, to remove anxieties for the team and customers yeah. alike. Absolutely, Fran. Niamh, there's a question in here for you, and that is listening to Niamh, I'm wondering how big the challenge is in terms of attracting investors when there is a social dimension to the business. Are there many impact investors in Ireland? Could you share some insights with us on that? Yeah, so there's, there's not really compared to like the US or the UK. Um, it is definitely growing, the kind of impact investment space, um, but it's very, very early stage. And I know someone else had mentioned, had kind of mentioned the nonprofit versus for profit. And, you know, that's something that we kind of talked about a lot initially um, about how we should set up. And there's kind of advantages and disadvantages to both. Like in one way as a nonprofit, especially in the early days, it's, it can be easier to raise philanthropic funding because we were raising funding from investors who were just doing it as a, like a purely philanthropic 
play so there was no um no return needed but then once you get to a certain point like it's very hard to raise kind of funding beyond that and then you can't you know there's no other types of finance you can raise um so that was challenging and um, but you know we have looked at different models like potentially looking at a hybrid model that would allow us to raise different types of finance but still have our nonprofit kind of mission at the core and i know mary mentioned their um, impact investment in the uk and there definitely is kind of a much more sophisticated impact investment market in the uk but i think there's an opportunity there in ireland and um, it may be an area that hopefully we'll see we'll see growing um, over the next few years. I've I've just posted your your Facebook link there up into into the chat there, Neve, because and um, you twenty three thousand uh, likes there on Facebook and and constantly growing, and um, and I, I just think it's it's the I think a lot of people want. I think a lot of people are very good in business. What I mean is good is they want to be good to the environment. They want to be good to society. They want to be good but they don't necessarily know how to make this work um, or how to convey that message. And, and that's why I think, you know, be, letting people know that, 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 your, uh, that your organization is there too, um, that can do that really, really well is, is very important. Um, at this Thanks, point, yeah. we're just at half 11. I just want to let you know, we've had 41 responses into what key takeaways did you glean from the speakers? Um, I've had loads and loads and loads of comments. I hope I've, I've tried to read out as many as I can. Um, there's a Bob Marley fan recognizing another one in the, in, the, in the chat here at the moment. So great to see all of that happening. Um, we're continuing, as I say, to, to collect those takeaways as we go along here. But I just want to say thanks so much to each of our three speakers, to Mary, to Lorraine and to Neve. You've been really, really wonderful. Um, before, before we go to a break, what I'd just like to do is tell you my key takeaways from, e from each of them. Um, and that is that from Mary, I got find a business partner, uh, someone that you can get on with. Um, she said, learn how to pivot and be able to pivot, pivot quickly, understand lots of great companies did so before. She said, speed and scale are of the essence. She said, start fundraise before you think you need to. She said, um, and, and also make sure when you are raising money to raise enough. She said to uh, networking is the name of the game and that uh, fundraising is a team sport. She said that um, make sure that you're looking for a reasonable valuation. That is, that is what's very, very important. Get whatever free money you can. Now, what she means there is in terms of, of grants uh, and so on. And she particularly mentioned the accelerator, which is up to two and a half million, which is grant. Um, she also mentioned the person who said that when they're fundraising, that can take up to three days a week of their time, which, which is a huge commitment. And she also said to watch out for the tire kickers. Then uh, Lorraine said um, positivity. She wants positivity radiating from the business. She said, are people going to believe in it as much as I do? And how do you get people to that point, both customers and staff and so on? She also mentioned hashtag not being on the high street. Now, I didn't get a chance to tell you this, uh, Lorraine, but I actually interviewed the founder of notonthehighstreet.com, mm. who had a very, very similar mindset to you. Um, and it was an online portal and so on. But I can see a lot of similarities there. She spoke about what the, the biggest, she spoke about a range of risks, but she said, you need to believe in yourself. You need to surround yourself with great people. Uh, a lot of people picked up on this and resonated on the screen um, on the area where we're capturing what people uh, took away is look from the outside within. And you reiterate that by taking the two days to really think about how you could react to COVID. She said, there's three solutions to every problem. And you know what's bizarre, ladies and gentlemen, is as she said it, her video went out. And do you think that video went down for 40 seconds before she was back up again? She says, there's three solutions to every problem. And she picks the one uh, and is going to go for it. She mentioned a Scottish system called Flow. She got people back up and running. She said she prides herself in knowing everybody and having a positive environment. She said passion is so important and she's as passionate now as she is, as she was 14 years ago when she started. The Neve spoke about ideas that can work and be hard to scale. She said start off in a manual way. So she mentioned, for example, how they did so in the barn with flyers, but learn what's valuable and what's not valuable and decide from there. She said commitment, passion and resilience are so important when you have teams or when you have teams of teams. Um, key thing she said that she learned is that you need to reach product fit, sorry, product market fit in order to scale. She said growth doesn't necessarily mean scale. She told us a great story about that. She said growth doesn't necessarily mean scale, but she says make sure that your KPIs allow that sustainability of scale. She said sometimes when you're scaling, you need to rethink a personal touch from maybe being there in person to a welcome video. 
letting go of what doesn't serve you is really what's important and what they're continuous, continuously working on is finding a sustainable revenue model. So on that note, a huge thanks to each of our three speakers. Please come back to us in six minutes time. We're going to get back on. Uh, we've got three fantastic influencers who are going to talk about that. We've got some pictures. We've got lots more going on. Last thing I want to say is the reason we didn't have breakout rooms is because the numbers went over the amount, the capability of where we could. And that's why we wanted to have this other method. So it's because there's so many of you here that we couldn't break you all out and bring you back in together. So that's why. So I'll see everybody in um, six minutes. Get a coffee, pop to the bathroom, tweet, empower, hashtag EmpowerConf, et cetera, and we'll see you all um, at 11.40. Thank you. Just while we're on a break there, Aoife, Sinead and Charlene, can I ask you all to turn on your videos, please? And thank you. Hi, Sinead. Hi, going great so far. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm trying to get the Instagram messages out. I'm not on Twitter so much these days. Good woman yourself. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hi, Aoife. Thank you very much. How are you? Perfect. Hi, Aoife. Hi, Sinead. How are you? Great. How are you keeping? Good. Good. Now we are just going to give everyone a couple of moments there to come back and uh, we're going to go again in three, three minutes time. Perfect. Hello. Okay. Charlene, can you hear us? I'll show you there in a second.
How's it going so far? Um, how's it good? Is that, is that Charlene? Aoife. Oh, Aoife, sorry. Yes, all is all is going very well. Sorry, I was... Uh, I, you're all you're all um, videos up there over my screen at the, at the moment, so I'm ma making sure I'm get, getting 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 right there with everybody. Um, now I'm going to. Yeah, it's really good, Aoife. I've been on it good. all morning. It's really good. Amazing! I step. I step. I I wanted to be on it like meetings this morning. Yeah, um, I I uh, blocked off my calendar for this morning because there's a good few speakers I wanted to hear. Oh, nice. Yeah. Perfect, Charlene. We have you there now. Great. Great stuff. Great stuff indeed. Well, uh, we have just 30 seconds to go. So um, what I'm just going to do is just remind everyone there um, who is on with us. I'm just going to check my chat. Right. So I'm just going to read out a couple of comments that have been, um, that have been coming in. So um, Diane says, going amazing. Uh, well done. Uh, well done, ladies. Finola says, spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, is an inspiration every year and this year is no exception. Fabulous energy. Thanks, Susan. Well, Finola, you're most welcome. But uh, my energy is easy to be high when I'm surrounded by all these, these fantastic people. Mary says, uh, Mary McKenna going really well, everyone. Had some great feedback from delegates. And you deserve it, Mary. Aoife says, excellent morning. Thank you, Mary, Lorraine and Neve, And of course, Susan and Maria. Um, Neve says, great to hear your stories too, Mary. Fab morning so far. And uh, thanks so much, Susan. Well, you're all very kind to me, but as I say, it's 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 the, the women who are here are making making all all of the, the all of the difference. Okay, so now that uh, now that everybody's back, hope that you all have got a coffee and uh, and have settled right in. So what I'm going to do first of all is that um, we are I'm going to ask you this time. I'm going to ask you a different question. I'm just going to pull this up here on my screen. And uh, okay, very good. Now. The so question, as we're going to move in into to the next phase of this, this event, we're going to start talking about digital marketing and specifically through influencing. However, what I think is really important, and I'm looking here on the other side of my screen to make sure that, that, that I get it uh, for you, is that what is really important to do is it's important that we know the type of support that you particularly need and would benefit from. So what I'm going to do here is I'm now going to ask you a separate question on that tool. I'm going to share my screen with you again and as we start i would just like to know when it comes to to your leo particularly because i'm gonna gonna ask the support that our influencers got over time when it comes to the leo what particularly is it that you're looking for and we have to give great credit uh today to um to both of the leos that are supporting us but before i talk about them i uh, just want to make sure that everybody who comes back can get on that link and there we go. Okay, so um, I want to, want to give, give credit today for sure uh, to Roscommon and to Mayo Leo. They have been really, really helpful for a start in, in helping us with the event. They are sponsoring the prize for the pitcher who is going to win uh, later on today. Um, but of course, they are hugely, hugely impactful in our local environments. Personally, I am a client of the Dublin City Leo, and that's where our business is based. Um, they have been very helpful to us both in their own right. We were uh, we recently got the trading online voucher. We got the business continuity voucher recently. But the key thing that I wanted to ask when it comes to the existing financial supports is there's a lot of supports out there that have absolutely nothing got to do with COVID or with Brexit or anything. They're, they're simply broadly there. The thing is, though, is that are, are they sufficient? Are they what you need? Um, and of course, the other thing is the Leo can be hugely helpful when it comes to signposting. And I'm going to tell you a brief story um, about one of my experiences about this. But just before I do, I'm also going to mention, so mentoring, of course, is a huge thing that they do. Access to the community is giving you access to other entrepreneurs, creating events, um, or simply creating a, a link into the community, whether it is telling about what funding opportunities are coming up or what events are taking place, just giving you access, that, that touch point in. So at the moment, based on what I'm seeing, 29 of you have voted. Um, as I said, there's well over 100 people on today. So I'm going to leave that open there. What help do you want from your Leo, whether it comes to signposting, existing financial supports, mentoring, training and events, access to community? So what, what do you need? If you go right over to the right is what you really need and right over to the left is what you don't really need all that much of. Okay, my brief story. My brief story is that um, four years ago, I came up with an idea. And what I did was I came up with the idea for how we might um, put this idea into practice 
in the business, but I didn't have a way of necessarily funding it. And it was all wound up in, um, in innovation. So this was going to be a high risk scenario. There's no way, no way anybody was going to fund this from an equity point of view. Um, so therefore, I had to look at other ways in which to fund this. So I came across the Innovation Partnership. Now, the Innovation Partnership is a way that you can get an idea funded by bringing money into the, not into your business, but into university that ultimately will do the work for you. So we applied for funding at Feasibility First, which was a 9,000 euro grant. And we got somebody to look into the innovation of the idea. And then we went for the much bigger one. It's up to a maximum of 200,000. And that money goes into university. The university builds out your innovation, then it's up to you to commercialize it. And that was signposted from the Leo, but it was also an existing financial support that very few people actually knew about. And that's something that Orla uh, would have worked an awful lot on in her previous job in CIT in terms of research and innovation. So that's what I mean by the existing financial supports. There's lots and lots available there. So we've had 38 responses. Again, I'm going to leave that up there on the link. I'm going to stop sharing there now. And I want to go back. Uh, I want to, to introduce you now to three truly um, amazing women. Uh, really, really, really are, I have to say, these, uh, wait, wait until you hear all of, all of what these, these are up to. So I want to start off today um, by telling you a little bit about Sinead, right? So what I have to say that I, I really admire about Sinead is that she saw what was coming long before many, many others did. So in the case of Sinead, what she did was that she saw that back then in the day, um, she saw that blogging was becoming a bigger and bigger area and where there was lots of people interacting with blogging. Um, but were they necessarily communicating with the brands that were out there and were, on the other hand, were brands connecting in with bloggers? And of course, bloggers then became bloggers and bloggers have now become influencers. And so throughout all of that, she made, created the Irish Blogger Agency and her, her other company called Mini Media. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about the environment that influencers operate in. Aoife then, Aoife is a truly, um, I have to say, another woman that I have since started following on Instagram, an absolute fashionista, fashionist of the highest degree, um, and really takes care of her followers. And, and uh, like when you talk about Neve and you talk about sustainability, you talk about Mary, you talk about something that really works and resonates and, and speed and pivoting. Aoife and the way in which she brings her passion into all of what her brand represents and the way in which she's interacted um, with her followers over the years and also found out in many times worked through the hard yards in order to understand true experience and making, making, it, making what matters. And then we have Charlene. So Charlene is in Enniscrone and Sligo. And one of the most important things that you can do in business is understand your USP, your unique selling point. And what I love about what Charlene has done is she really speaks to that woman in rural Ireland, the woman that I grew up with, as who can't always pop into Brown Thomas and pick up your Mac makeup or, or a variety of other things, needed to go to the local pharmacy in order to get your makeup, which is where mine comes from, by the way. And, uh, and then from then built her business on showcasing the various different products that are there. And she really, again, if you follow her on Instagram, she tells the real tale, she shows how much she looks into these products and, and so on like that. She's also hugely popular as a bridal makeup artist. Anybody that emails her, you will know, Number one, she is booked out for 2020 and 2021. Number two, she does her admin one day a week. And number three, if you email her for the second time, she reads her emails from old to new, so you go to the bottom of the pile. Believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, I know a lot about these women <laughs> based on simply looking at the way in which they interact with their followers all the time. And that is what influencing truly is, is all about. So on that note, let's, let's hear from, the, from the, the women themselves. Maybe, Sinead, we'll start with you. Could you define the idea of what the world of, influ of influencer marketing is and how it's changed since your earliest experiences with it? Yeah, thanks so much um, for the introduction there, Susan, and thanks for having me here as part of the panel. Um, so I might start um, back in 2013 and what uh, influencer marketing was when I, I set out uh, with my blog, um, so it was 2013 and I was in the bank and um, I was, I was to say I was a banker by day and a blogger by night. I set up my own fashion blog uh, to entertain uh, mothers where I'd read blog about fashion and beauty. So um, I suppose when I set out, I was raw to it. The only other influencer I knew was So Sue Me. And um, when I went looking on Instagram and Twitter and uh 
the other platforms that I was only getting in tune with at the time because social media was so raw to me. Um, I couldn't really find any other influencers. So basically in 2013, there was no influencers or bloggers that I knew of, in particular anyway, in the West of Ireland where I'm based, I'm here in Galway. So um, I used the social media platforms at the time, which was Twitter. Uh, I put it out there, if there was any influencers or bloggers, I think they were referred to more so back in 2013. Uh, if there was any uh, bloggers out there who wanted to meet up, I was going to organize an afternoon tea in the G and uh, if anybody wanted to join me, uh, come along. So with that, I decided to organize some goodie bags. Uh, afternoon tea would be no good without a little surprise. So I um, hooked up with Car Pharmacy there in Galway City and uh, we got together 20 goodie bags and there was 20 bloggers at the event and we had a fabulous um, afternoon there. Twitter was on fire, everybody was tweeting and um, I think it literally struck me straight away at that point, my God, the power of social media and how I could be one blogger in the West of Ireland, um, literally wrought this whole industry and within a couple of hours we could get 20 bloggers together. So that was amazing power. Um, from there on, then a year later, we ended up um, hosting our uh, first birthday party and it was a sellout event in, in four hours. We sold 120 tickets. So that just shows you the scale of how blogging went from in one year. It went from 20 bloggers that I knew of to 120 coming from all around Ireland to meet us back in the G. And also there we had brands uh, showcasing their, their wares under uh, the roof. And obviously Twitter and Instagram was on fire again. So I suppose from there then uh, we're in 2020 and influencer marketing is uh, the buzzword now. It's, it's all about influencer marketing and it's not going away. And uh, look at, um, you, you have now got the advertising standards of Ireland, you know, putting um, communications in place where bloggers have to use uh, hashtags and fully declared that it's marketing communication. So this is actually a really welcoming thing as well for it. Um, so that's the major change that has happened um, probably and how influencer marketing has grown in the last number of years. Well, and, and I think I think you're right, Sinead. I think you're right. It's not it's not going away. And I think that there's there's a completely different sense of relationship between a brand and it's and it's followers or its audience now in terms of, of you know authenticity is always the word that comes up here. But but if I mean you've been you've been particularly good at, at really collecting data, I suppose, from your audience and using that to to influence your own influencership thereafter. How how has that worked for you, or how did you do that in the first place? Yeah, I think a big thing for my brand is to really create a community online. So whether that's through my newsletters or whether it's through interacting with talking about, even say in the cottage at the moment, when, when we're picking furniture, we're interacting with the with our followers then. So it's, I think it's always about engaging with them through whatever I do, whether it's creating a new collection or piece, picking a piece of furniture. I always love to ask them for their opinion and feel like, really make them feel like they're part of everything I do. I'm really proud of the community. So I think creating a community is a huge thing for me at EFA Ireland. And Charlene, I have, I've watched you do your, your nighttime routine. That video that, that, that you did, myself and Maria and Sandra, a few of us were talking about this. I mean, you really took us through everything from the mist to the journal to the whole, the whole shebang. Like you really let people into your home, Charlene. So do you, do you feel the same as Aoife, is that bringing your audience into everything you do is very, very important? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's about, it's a two-way relationship between you and your followership, really. Um, and it's about communicating with them so that it's, it's a friendship at the end of the day. And you have to respect that friendship just like you would respect your circle of friends in real life, I suppose. Um, because the reality is, if it wasn't for your followership, you wouldn't have the opportunities and you wouldn't have a page to do anything on. So I totally agree with Aoife and that, that it's about building a community, it's about building relationships, and it's about nurturing those little seeds and watching those plants grow. Um, there have been some women with me from the very start, from 2012, 2013, from when I first set up my Facebook page. Some of those women are still with me on my journey, and my lifestyle has completely changed from a 23-year-old young girl who was just into makeup and just loved makeup to 
a now married woman. I'm a mother of two, you know, so some of those women have grown with me on that journey and it's really lovely to see. Um, and as you mentioned a word before, authenticity, and that's something that I really pride myself on and it's something I hear back time and time again is that, you know, that people see me as being genuine and authentic and um, it, it is really, really important to let people in um, to build those relationships. And I, I st when, when I was introducing you there, Charlene, I mean, I, the, the way in which you've determined your USP is, is, is I, think it's, I think it's brilliant. And I think it really does speak to a lot of people uh, who can empathize with you. But did you, did you find your USP or did your USP find you? Um, well, I suppose I am that person that I'm talking to as well. So like I understood from that woman's point of view what she needed um, because I was frustrated. I was looking for what I now offer so and I knew that there were at that time at the very start I knew that there were dozens if not even hundreds of other women that were in similar positions it was just about reaching them and that's the power of social media and um, so yeah I would say that I was that woman and um, I still am that woman um, and I'm consistently always trying to talk to her and answer her queries or answer her questions whether that's through an actual direct messaging and us talking one-to-one -one, or by just doing my nighttime routine um which is very generic and very specific to me but education is always what it comes back to I, you would never see me just say i'm using this foundation here today throwing it on everything has an, has an education aspect behind it it's like okay what texture is it what coverage is it how much is it where can you get it how to apply it best you know so it's always always coming back to before they even would ask you the question, you're answering it for them, um, because that's what people want. To and know, on, on, and they, on they want note, the information. They want to know. Uh, and I, I think the education is, is is key. And I'm just going to read out a, a, a range of comments that have come in here. So one says, "Really looking forward to hearing these three ladies speak." And somebody else says, I've learned everything I know on social media from Sinead and Mini Media. Fantastic training. She's so positive, energetic and informed. That seems to be coming up again and again and again today is about the positivity. And it's also coming from the audience. When we ask the audience, you know, what, uh, what has the pandemic done to your mindset? A lot of the answers were very positive. Um, Jane says, I have, oh, there we go. Uh, sorry, that was, that was, that was Jane. Um, uh, then also uh, shows how Sinead, this is one for Sinead, uh, shows how the blogging industry has grown. Sinead looks at micro-influencers, which is very interesting too. Some startups can't afford influencers. So good to be able to access this, the, the lesser known ones too. Aoife, well done on the opening of your new shop in Adair. Can't wait to see it. Spotted you in the, in the national um, press last week. Fran says, love it, Charlene. Everything has an education to it. So authentic. Mary McHugh says, lovely to see Charlene. She, she did my makeup as mother of the bride. Lovely, lovely memories. So um, Aoife, can, can we go to you? Tell us about, tell us about the shop in Adair and, and what happened. How did you get to that and so on? Yeah, so I'm currently in it. We actually moved in, myself and my team moved in this, oh no, last week now. God, it's already nearly been two weeks. Um, so yeah, it actually came up during COVID, which is crazy. Um, like previously before COVID, um, I was supposed to move to Dublin and I was supposed to move up there into the studio space. But since COVID happened, I suppose I started to slow down and really like focus on what I actually wanted to do. And moving to Dublin wasn't the right move to me. I think for me, I was in a great space where I could make my garments, where I could showcase other Irish artists that we're having here and really have like an innovative hub where I can really test sustainability and Irish and different things like that. So when the cottage came up in Adair, which is 15 minutes from me, it's an old Tatch cottage. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's the cutest little cottage in Adair village. Um, it's just, it's, um, well, it's in Limerick, but it's so cute. And everything about my brand is Irish heritage. So to have a Tatch cottage just, it made so much sense. Um, so yeah, that was a month ago now that I signed the lease and everything like that. So we've been working on it since and it's nearly good to go. We're having like a big shoot in here this weekend to sort of show the insides and launch everything and then hopefully we'll be open to the public the week after. I can just see the excitement oozing from you <laughs> as, as well. <laughs> I can't wait to just have it like done. I've been painting for like the past month so I'm excited to be nearly ready. And, and on, on that note Aoife, how have you crafted the short and the long-term vision? Because I can imagine this is a manifestation of something you've dreamed of for a while. So how does, how does the short-term and the long-term, how, how do you do that? 
Oh, so I'm re I'm big into um, vision boards. Like it's it's like my thing. So even like for my team, I have we've just done up like a three page vision of like where we see it going. And I think it's something that is so important if you're a brand starting off to really dream big and just put all your visions out there, no matter how scary they are. They're like, hey, I'm never gonna do that. Like never think something is too big. I I'm really big into like having all your visions just thrown out in front of you and then really like delve into like the detail okay like if you're having if you want a shop like what will the shop look like in three years time so I have sort of manifested this in my head I didn't think it'd be so soon but I have I am big into manifestations I'm really believing believing in a vision and I really think setting working backwards from your visions then of as to how you're going to get to your visions um, I think it's so important um, to have like that sort of mind frame in how you work, especially having businesses. I think it's hard to sometimes, sometimes you can lose track of, you know, where you want to go. But I think it's really important to have a solid vision. And especially if you have a team around you, you want them to know where you see yourself going as well. So, um, yeah, having a three or one, two and three year vision is huge for me. Well, you're getting a lot of, lot of agreement here from people. And Mary says, really agree with Eve on this point about dreaming big, setting out your vision. Sandra says, dream big, use a vision board to see it. Claire says, yes to vision boards XX. Um, now, and one more question for you also, Aoife. Who is your target market for your shop? Is it Irish or Americans? Um, well, they, they might be, yeah, they'll be on shortly. Um, Adair would be uh, very much a tourist destination. So just wondering. Yeah, so I suppose the tourist season is nearly over. Well, not that there was much of one this year, but I don't think um, the Americans will be my target market. I'm obviously not going to turn anyone away, but I suppose I'm, I'm big into, um, you know, I suppose a girl for a birthday party or business women. I'm also big into brides, which is something that we're looking into a lot here, bespoke um, consultations. So I do have um, a mix of different, and I think it's normally like one of my biggest customers is, um, if it's a 21st birthday or a big okay home and they pick out pieces um, like blouses and things like that but brides is another thing that we're uh, working on at the moment. Great well I mean there, there's, there's, huge, there's a lot, lot of activity go, going on there and Sinead I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come, come back to you and particularly I'm just going to put this, this, this point to you. So Grania said I admire all of these ladies. I launched my business in late July and sold out in only nine minutes thanks to social media engagement that was built on the lead up to that launch. And what I do wonder Sinead is like what are the ingredients of a successful brand and influencer relationship particularly if like possibly in the case of Grania she was her own brand but what you see as the key ingredients what can people here today really learn from each of the three of you that they can implement themselves? Yeah, so it's vital that you connect with the right influencer. Do you know there's so many influencers out there now that it can be difficult to, you know, uh, get through the hashtags and figure out who you're meant to be following or who's going to be the best person to promote your product and talk about it. Um, like Charlene said and yourself said there earlier, you have to find somebody who's authentic in what they're saying and you have to have a connection with them. So um, that's the starting point. Um, and because of my online platform now, the Irish Blogger Agency, Influencer Marketing Agency, has um, this fantastic platform now. Um, we had the opportunity to partner with um, a Swedish uh, company who have now um, powered this platform where I have over 800 influencers currently on the platform with the reach of uh, 8 million. And it's all broken into different categories. So instead of you searching uh, your Instagram or your Twitter looking at hashtags to find the right influencer. Um, you can now log on to this platform and find the influencer you're looking for. Um, so I suppose once you do find the influencer, then it's important to, you know, follow them on social media for, for a while and, and get to a feel for who they are and what they are. Um, because, you know, it takes a while to get to know somebody and their antics on social media and to make sure they're a perfect fit for your brand. Um, so I suppose that's definitely a good place to start. And also then when you do engage with the influencer, start nurturing them and um, giving them a little bit of room to contribute to the campaign if you're going to have a campaign with them. And um, yeah, I suppose that's it, Susan. So then, um, well, again, there's, there's a range of comments coming in here, but Mary just said, what's the name of this platform for finding an influencer, Sinead? You might just, just repeat that. Yeah, so irishbloggeragency.com. 
And can we also ask you then, Sinead, what about the other side, right? So like, how does somebody know that they're an influencer? How could they, how would they know if, okay, should I reach out to Sinead? Maybe I'm an influencer. Maybe I'm the one that should be going to you saying, well, can I become your 801st? Um, what, what determines if somebody is an influencer and when should they be reaching out to you from that side? Yeah, so um, my particular niche is micro-influencers. So, uh, so that's, I would consider anyone with influence uh, or followers over a thousand followers on um, their preferred platform. Um, and then a combination, they could have Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. It could take them up to 3,000. So anyone who's a following of a thousand. But it doesn't come down to just the followings. It comes down then to the engagement. You could have another uh, influencer with 5,000 followers and the 1,000 uh, followers may have more engagement. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a mix of, of both. And our platform will actually show that um, real life data. It can show you how many followers the influencer has. And also it looks at the, the key uh, engagement rate. So you're not going into a blind uh, collaboration or a blind contract with an influencer. You can see all the data there. And as um, there's a tremendous growth in influencer marketing, data is becoming key. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that, that's, that certainly, certainly is the case. I, I think many might be surprised at that, actually, Sinead, that if you have like a thousand people on one particular platform and there's engagement there, that, that you could move into the realm and, and maybe be, anybody who wants to, um, who, who wants to, to talk to, to any one of our, of our three panelists here today on social media, we're going to make sure that, that you have all their, their handles, etc. Charlene, you've moved through a range of phases with your own business, with the bridal makeup, with the influencer, uh, with the influencer ship, I suppose, but also, of course, um, just over your head there as well, there is a brand that some people may may be familiar with, because then, of course, you've ventured into into creating your own brand, like like Eva has done, um, and and in fact, like like Sinead has done in in her own way as well. So, what were the triggers for you to take each step? Would you mind take us through that? Almost like how how I, I put the same question to Lorraine about the same how she made decisions to move forward. Yeah, um, so I suppose it was an evolve of just my career and my own personal goals and my own true happiness, really, at the end of the day. Um, that was what was important to me. So when I started off um, as a professional makeup artist, I worked full time as well as working just Fridays and Saturday mornings. Um, so I had a full time job whilst I was still doing makeup because at the time, eight years ago, makeup wasn't really seen as a, a valid career, I suppose, as such um, on its own. But now it's, it's blown up entirely. And I suppose the Facebook started back in 2000 and, 2010, 2011. And I suppose the business aspect of Facebook started. And I was actually working for a marketing agency, a digital marketing agency. So I was training other businesses on Facebook marketing for business. So it just went hand in hand that I... It was like every entrepreneur just seeing an opportunity there for um, whatever my voice was that I was using social media and using Facebook at the time and Twitter to literally talk to other women. And as I mentioned earlier, it was about that reach of like, how do I reach these women and how do I talk to them without having to meet me in person? So the Evolve then of Facebook, I remember once doing, um, it was one of the very first um few months of video marketing when it first launched onto Facebook and I suppose it was just the case of feeling the fear and doing it anyway because video marketing was very much like oh god I hate video I hate seeing myself you know we all have a little bit of that but I literally just had to grab it by the balls and literally just go like and just record what I thought people wanted to see and it was a five minute makeup video that I did and at the time I only had about 5,000 followers on Facebook and the video had a viewership of over 35,000 within 48 hours. So it just showed like the viral aspect of video and how strong it actually was. And I suppose coming back to it again, it was education. What is the customer or the follower going to get out of it? And for me, it was answering that common query of the five minute makeup. So my followership grew and grew and grew as a result really of that video and just feeling the fear and just going out there and just putting my knowledge out there on the internet. And then throughout social media, like it has evolved over the last eight, nine years, and it has been Facebook, there's been Twitter, um, and then there was Snapchat. And I really felt like Snapchat, although it wasn't really a professional business platform, that was really where I saw the most of my growth. Um, and again, it was introducing that whole video aspect to business. 
um, saw my growth on Snapchat, then Instagram was introduced and Instagram took a lot of the features from Snapchat. But ultimately, it was coming back even to what Aoife mentioned earlier, it was about building that relationship. That was always what it was about. And always never having all your eggs in one basket. Never, you know, I often always say to businesses, like if social media was to shut down in the morning, where would your business be? And that was always, always in the back of my mind. So it was always making sure that you didn't have all your eggs on one social media or didn't have all your eggs ultimately in one basket that you always have something to fall back on. So bridal makeup was my bread and butter. The online side of it just was something that I really enjoyed doing and educating people, um, which did turn into a business um, side of, the, of, of my business as well in terms of um, I traveled around the country doing sellout makeup master classes where I would have 50 to 200 women in a room and I'd be educating them and teaching them on makeup. And then where Ella and Joe came out of then was actually myself and my business partner, Nee Ryan. It was literally a case of answering questions, again, answering common, common skin concerns. We both have an extremely strong passion for skin and for skincare. It goes hand in hand with the work that I do already. Um, and our very first product was an, a makeup brush cleaner, um, which was an antibacterial brush cleaner. And people often kind of don't associate, um, like our motto is, clean brushes equals clear skin, you know? So it was actually how cleaning your brushes is part of your skincare routine. And we like to create products that make women's lives easier and ultimately helping them to feel more confident in themselves because they will have better skin um, as a result. So it has just evolved, I suppose, from, from my perspective, a bit like Aoife as well. It's like looking at that vision board, my lifestyle has changed over the last few years um, where I'm now a mom of two under two. So I suppose I just always had to set myself up that I always had plan B's um, in business and that I wasn't putting everything all, um, as I said, in the one basket. So it has just evolved. I, I, I never forced anything. I just went with the flow. I never had any motives when it came to social media. It was never about brands approaching me. Um, I just, it was always about the woman on the other side. And I think that's just where then my relationship um, with brands came through was that they saw the authenticity between my relationship and my followers and they just wanted me then to promote their brands. And yeah, that, that was kind of the evolve. I, I, I suppose it's, I've just taken everything in my stride um, keeping everything extremely professional um, always making sure that whether it's a brand, whether it's the follower, it's always about a two-way system what do they get out of it and what do I get out of it you know mm -hmm. so that you're always communicating that and that everybody kind of knows where they stand you know well I, I think I think it's interesting just how you talk about how the brands have changed as well like whether you go from like we mentioned Facebook and then Snapchat now Instagram Sinead what, where do you see the, the future being is it is it all about Facebook is it is Facebook gone is is Instagram only where it's at what about Twitter is there a new one what about TikTok what, what, do, what do you think there? If we could get yeah, a free well, consultation um, from Lily Media. Uh, I'm in my 40s now. I just turned 43 there uh, at the weekend. So I'm oh, all about Facebook. <laughs> the Facebook, uh, the Instagram. I used to love Twitter. Like Twitter was fantastic when I started out. You know, um, it was a great place to um, engage with people and connect with people. And I actually built up a massive online community there. Um, and it was great to meet some of them people offline. Um, but I also have uh, uh, almost two teenagers in the house. One is uh, 15 and the other is turning uh, 13 this month. So they're all about the TikTok. Um, even the Insta stories now um, and the ads coming up there. So it really depends on your audience. You have to find out where your audience are hanging out. So if you're marketing uh, teenage clothing or trying to sell uh, to that audience, they're hanging out right now on TikTok and Instagram stories. Um, so know your audience and uh, maybe focus on two platforms. That's what I always say first. Don't get overwhelmed by them all, you know. So um, pick two that suits your audience and your business. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, so Rachel says happy birthday, Sinead. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, Mary from Westbeck. Thanks for your support for Empower Also is another. Um, Sandra says, wonderful to have the opportunity to showcase all the local talent and share the learnings. Now, Mary Ryan put some interesting points. And I'm going to put it to you, Sinead, on this. And that is, she says, don't forget the power of LinkedIn for making business to business connections. Great webinar and panelists, excellent. Um, well done, Empower. And absolutely, well done to Empower. You're, you're all amazing. Um, and I, I don't say, say that lightly. 
but I, I have certainly found myself that I do LinkedIn video quite a lot and it's probably the one that gets the most reach and I have a very clear message that I want to get across and an awful lot of where the, the business that I'm in is business to business. So I find LinkedIn is, is really great for that. But yet when I look at the capability, let's say of LinkedIn video, it isn't a patch on Facebook video or, or IGTV or anything else like that. What are your thoughts on, on LinkedIn for marketing particularly? Um, I don't know how I forgot about LinkedIn because um, I've been on LinkedIn since I was, had my 15 year career in the bank. So that's where I started out as well between Twitter and LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is so powerful. Um, obviously the cost of advertising on LinkedIn um, is cheaper also. Um, so definitely um, LinkedIn is another um, fantastic platform and especially for B2B. Well, I, a question has just come in here now that I think I would just maybe like to, to, to just qu uh, quickly check in with you all. And please do send in your, your comments. Send them in on chat, send them in the, the Q&A, send them in where, wherever you like, wherever you can find me, send, send them in to me. Um, and that is, how do you manage your time with social media? With work-life balance, I can imagine it eats into that also. And I, you know, I, I, I follow you all uh, and I've seen, I've seen work and life balance um, or certainly one blend into the other with several of your posts. So could I just maybe just, just go around, maybe I'll start with you, Aoife. Does, does social media eat into that? Yeah, so I, for me, I'm really big into scheduling my time. So I'm really big into planning ahead for when it comes to social media and like posting online. So I have UNUM, so it sort of tracks out your whole week as to how you're going to post because sometimes you, yeah, it does take up a lot of time and it is very time consuming doing social media and then having a business and trying to do two pages if you have your business account as well. But I think it's starting with planning ahead and like scheduling your posts and getting a file of back. Okay, so getting ahead, planning your posts. And file of facts, so just for planning everything out. But yeah, sorry, my internet went there. Um, yeah, well, I know. Well, I, I was just about to say. I, I think. I think that that's that's the key idea. Is that if you know, you can you can create boundaries around that. And um, Charlene, does in your case, I mean. Does does it eat into your work life balance? Does it blend it more? Does it you know bind it more? Oh, uh, that's something that I work on constantly. Um, and as I said, I have two children under the age of two, so the last two years definitely has challenged me to say the least. And trying to find that work life balance. And kudos to I'm actually on the Empower Her program, and kudos to the team and the guys there. They're very very good at helping us, you know, to really really emphasize and structure you know, our time um, because we spend so much time working in the business that we forget to actually work on the business ourselves. So I've actually been, since having my firstborn, um, I just over two years ago, I definitely had to get much better at structuring my, my weekly um, calendar. So a bit like Aoife, I have my content calendar as such done out and I work very closely with a lot of brands. And then obviously I'm running my own brand, Ella and Joe Cosmetics. So I have to really structure out the week um and making sure that i internally am happy you know because that's what it's all about for me it's about you know being at home with my kids as much as i can and when i'm at home with them i'm at home with them and i'm not working whilst at home with them you know and that sometimes does eat into each other and there's nothing you can do about that i i don't have any guilt you know when when weeks like that happen so but trying as much as you can to have a 90 to 95 percent structure um, like I'm laughing at you about my, my autoresponder on my email. Everything for me is about reducing down the amount of manual work that I actually have to do in the business. So whether that's a very clear autoresponder, you know, which is essentially my response to my customer that my diary is closed or previous to when my diary was closed, it was people would send an email and say, hi, Shireen, just wondering, are you available on this date? I had an autoresponder that brought them to a web page on my on my website that I wanted all the information from them, like how many people, where did they live, so that when I went back to them, that there wasn't three or four emails going back and forth. That literally I had all the information in one go. My I had one form of communication and that was purely through my email. I cut out the the business phone. I cut out the the answering messages and DMs for appointments. It was all through one avenue, and that's what ultimately it was all about. Just structuring myself so that I had that I could be as focused and be as um, kind of as focused as I could be mm -hmm. on each mm -hmm. given day. And 
I try to be strict with myself. So I have my set days when I work on things, but sometimes things overlap and that's okay too. And um, that's just life of being a mum and being an entrepreneur, you know, that um, you can't have a balance all of the time. Well, what, I'm just going to mention two, two things there to people if anybody wants to pick up on that. One is that if you want to create like what, uh, what, Charlene's there, what Charlene says there on your website, collecting all the information, a Google form can, 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 do, can, can work like that in a free area. And a great tool to actually describe where people can decide on the time that they can pick, let's say, to, to book your time or something like that can also be Calendly. Um, I use that as well for, for different things that can be that can be very, very helpful. Sinead, can I can I go to you on this? Um, actually, on, on the whole idea of, of work-life balance, but also I just, just want to mention again a couple of more comments that are coming in. Anne says great speakers, very interesting morning. Thank you, Empower. Absolutely, Anne. Thank thank you too. Jackie says, I'm so impressed by these amazing women. Their authenticity and approachability is inspiring, and it makes total sense why they're successful in their fields. As somebody just taking the very first steps into the world of business, do you think it's important to have mentors? And do you have any advice in getting a mentor? So many questions about so many things and so much to learn, but I am conscious that business women are busy. Are business networking agencies the best place to start? Or is it better to have one or two mentors? Sinead? God, it, it, the timing of this question is just ironic. Um, if you had asked me this a year ago, I would have said I've never worked with a mentor. And, uh, in September, um, I had to make a decision, September 2019, I need somebody in my life. I can't be talking to my husband. I can't be wrecking my teenagers' heads anymore. So I, I went and uh, found a coach. Um, literally, she spoke to me online through an Instagram ad. Um, and it turns out I got four months coaching with her um, to re-change my mindset um, I was kind of on a hamster wheel because when you're working for yourself as a solo entrepreneur and I have a lot going on as well with the three kids and and um, so definitely um, getting a mentor not only freed up hours but made me realize um, what um, were my values and took me back a step to make me realize I didn't have to work 80 hours a week. Um, since then I've continued working with another mentor on a, on a different topic um, she's a conscious creation coach and I've been working with her since January um, and I've reduced my hours from probably 80 to 40 and I've tripled my sales even in COVID so working with the mentor I couldn't even put enough value on it um, I've just it's just been amazing in my life Wow, that's 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 quite the that's that's quite the advice there, there, Sinead. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one more question to Aoife, then I'm going to do the same as I did in the first panel. I'm going to put up a, a screen again where you can put in your takeaways, and I'm going to ask the speakers to comment on them. But if I want to put this to you, a um, couple of comments first. By the way, thank you so much to this amazing audience. You make my job so easy. All I have to do is read what you're telling me here and uh, and put it to these fantastic speakers. Number one, Grania says, again, I agree with this. Graw Chocolates was first launched on Instagram, but I quickly realized that my target audience was on Twitter, and that has proven to be a much more effective way to target my target audience. And then, though, Christine says, Aoife, and this is a question I really want to put to you, social media is something I worry about. And is it a good idea to employ somebody to do it for you if you can afford it? I'm going back to the authenticity point. Um, and I know I could go to Sinead on this and she'd have a lot to tell me, but I particularly want to pick up, like, you know, your brand is, is, is new. You're, uh, you're somebody that really wants to drive the brand forward. Your name is in your brand as well. So how would you feel about taking on somebody to, 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 to do your social media for you? I suppose I'm two different. So I suppose I have Aoife McNamara, which is my personal social media, and then I have Aoife Ireland, which is my brand. So I actually do have um, interns working on the Aoife Ireland one at the moment, but everything that goes on to that is content that I have created. So I've created my own, like, say, if it's a Pinterest board, if there's a Pinterest inspiration photos, or if they're um, photos from content from Aoife Ireland. They're all images that I've chosen already. So I'm definitely not against someone else doing your social media, but I think you should always know what's going to be going up. Like I can see her plan for the week and I can say, oh, I don't like that photo. I like this photo. So I think it's very important to know if you're getting someone, they know your vision. That's the vision again. You both ally with the same vision. She knows what you want. She knows what messaging you want to um, tell your um, customers. So it's all very important to sort of bring it back to having boards, having a schedule in place so that you know what exactly is going out on your business account if you have someone else doing it. 
Um, but for my own personal one, I would, I would, I would never change that to not me. Um, and, and again, I think I think that that's that's a really important point to make. There is is you know where 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 do you draw the line? Um, I'm I'm put the link in there. Uh, I've put the, put the link into the chat. Please do uh, pop up your key takeaways from today, uh, from this from this particular uh, group of speakers. I'm going to I'm just just going to um just going to read out some more lots more here comments. Um, uh, Eva say or sorry, Elvis says Eva would love to hear more on your thoughts on mentoring versus coaching. Uh, Anya says, 100% agree with Aoife, it's so important that anyone managing your social media accounts knows your vision. Um, never have all your eggs in one basket, Charlene, that's for you. Um, they are human, they are focused, and they know what they need and how to do it. I think that definitely goes to you all. Uh, again, I think, uh, Charlene, this is one of your statements. It's about the woman on the other side. Um, Aoife, Sinead, I mean, clear, sorry, you all, all highly organized and finding smart ways of using your time. Um, they're down to earth normal, so needed in our world today. And I think, I, I don't know whether the three of you do a lot of this, but I think you, you do it very well. But I also think this is a really, really other great way to connect with people so that they get a chance to, to talk to you behind. Uh, be, in, in essence, it's the business behind the brand we, we've got to see today. Great to hear that we do not have to use all social media. Sinead, that's, that's one for you. Structure, schedule and discipline. Stay authentic, focus on where your clients hang out. Um, I think, uh, again, that one could have come from you all in different ways. Work backwards to get your vision manifestation. Aoife, you've been clearly very, very consistent in that about the vision um, and, and making, making that manifest. Um, authenticity, uh, efficiency, passion and love, Charlene's grab it by the balls. There you go, Charlene. That, that one was definitely attributed to you. Um, I love Sinead's insight that she is selling to. That's uh, herself. Um, it grounds her and makes her authentic. Um, match social media with your customers, be authentic, develop relationships, connect with the right influencers, have a vision, plan your time. People can identify with all three. So as you can see here, there's really an awful lot that people are taking away and I'm gonna leave that run there. Also on my other screen, I have three screens here in front of me, by the way, just so that, that everyone's aware that this is, this is how I'm managing. And um, Mary says, hard to let someone do our marketing as counseling is such a delicate area to work with and to connect with people in their struggle and that's understandable. Kathleen Kinsley said, Susan Hayes Cullerton was my mentor. Sorry, I didn't realize it's going to come up. Susan Hayes Cullerton was my mentor a few years ago. Great help to find, to help me find my way in business. Really delighted to hear from you, Kathleen. And, and thank you very much um, for, for mentioning that. Brian says, Jim Sharp grew rapidly by using influencers. Ashling says, I think it's important to know what pitfalls exist in your sphere in regards to social media. I'm hoping to make something to help my special needs sister, but my God, the anti-vaxxers who jump on any comments that you make. Um, and then, yeah, a ra range of other com comments that, that jump in there. So the three of you can see what people are picking up on, on what you're saying. And um, maybe as we, we go to your last, you, you, the last word from you, again, they keep coming in, we're going up to 26 there. Um, so we'd really love to hear lots more of what you've taken out of today. Lisa says, three very passionate women in business. Um, if I was to ask you, Sinead, what's the one key thing that you think really resonates with people that resonated this morning um, that you think is really important that you want to, to drive home before we finish? Yeah, I think um, from influencer marketing point of view, it's not as scary as people think. Um, there is ways of finding influencers um, at the click of a button. Um, the cost, there is a cost, um, but if you find the right influencer, it'll be worth it. When it comes to the social media, I mean, there's so many platforms out there now and you can get overwhelmed in the whole digital marketing space between setting up your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, whatever it may be, as well as a website, as well as email marketing. But if you sit down and think of it, like make your plan and, and plan your strategy. If you don't have a strategy, you're, you're directionless and it doesn't all happen, don't have to happen overnight like I plan to grow Irish blogger agency um, for the next 10 20 years it can be a slow burn at the start but it will be worth it so have patience and try not to get overwhelmed if, if you can at all and I'm actually just going to um, just to ask if uh, if part or somebody from the empower team might actually just share the details for Sinead of Irish blogger agency and uh, mini media. So if anybody wants to reach out to Sinead directly, either as a brand or as a potential influencer, um, just, just want to make sure that everybody has has their details. 
Aoife, uh, in your case, what do you feel is the real key thing that, that you want people to leave with today? And like, obviously, again, we can see here what, what people are, are resonating with. Is it the vision board? Is it the passion? Is it the planning? What key thing do you want to make sure people leave with today? I think it's definitely starting with like, what is your passion? What would you do in the morning, like happily? Um, so starting with really finding out what you love doing and starting a vision board, dreaming like crazy hopes like just go totally out there of like where you see yourself even 10 years time and really create that picture manifest it in your head of like where you want to go and then work backwards on how to get there so yeah I think it's starting with a vision board I think it's so 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 important and yeah that's that's certainly something something that, that that's coming up here a lot and um, I love to do it myself I'm a journaler myself more so than more so than than, than visual and um, I have to say by the way I'm in I'm in complete awe of, of the three of you the way in which you do what you do um in many ways I I'm not actually a great visual person I, I have to get a lot of help in that um as I told somebody in Empower during the week I actually I go to a personal shopper once a year because I can't dress myself I can make a google sheet or a spreadsheet sing and dance for you but when it comes to picking anything to wear, yeah, I was kindly given this a present of a personal shopper um, experience from my mother, which was, you know, kindly telling me, uh, come on now, we have to do something here. And um, Char Char Charlene, in, in your case, uh, also as well, if I could ask somebody from the Empower team to please share Aoife Ireland and Aoife McNamara's uh, details on the, on the chat. Um, Charlene, the one key thing you'd like people to take away, loads of what you've said has, has appeared here on my own vision board, um, generated here by everybody. We've 27 comments. Please do keep them coming. We'll share them with everybody afterwards and they're all anonymous. So it's, it's, it's great to just hear your, what, people, what people have heard you say. But what key thing do you want to make sure they take from what you've said today? Um, so I suppose learning, education, so it's all about the what's in it for them and what's in it for, you know, for me as well. It's about taking everything that's like up here in your head and in what way or what form can I put it out there on social media or on a digital level? Um, because obviously we're all in business and we've all gone into business for whatever reason we have. We have all this information, we have all this knowledge, but when we are in the business, we just take it for granted that people understand and that people know what's up in our heads, whereas it's not. So it's about talking to your customer, finding out who he or she or they are um, and finding out, you know, what exactly it is that they want and then figuring out what way from a digital aspect can you bring that voice across. And even just something earlier, whenever you were talking about the social media, something that was really, really essential for us as a brand, for Ella and Joe, was actually building what's called a brand Bible. And that is everything from... The, your logo to your color structures to your vision your mission like what your voice is who your customer is and um, something that we were even working on through the empower program is like your empathy map figuring out who your customer is what he or she wants what are they interested in what do they do what like where do they eat do they eat out do they get takeaways you know like really figuring out who your customer is and then learning how it is that you need to talk to them and that you're not using social media as an advertising tool always remember that it's like a two-way conversation um, and that you're always trying to what is in it for the customer every single time you post on social media it's what value is this bringing to the end user or what are they going to be able to take home from it and then measure it um, measure like how those posts or how those um, blogs or whatever it is that you might be doing how are they performing it's all about measuring and seeing um, you know, what possibly may be performing better than others. Um, and it's always just about talking to your customer. It's always about talking to your followers and um, measuring and what's in it for them. And that's kind of it. And on, on that note, also, we, uh, the, the team at Empower have just shared uh, Charlene's details on Instagram and both on Ella and Joe and Char Charlene Flanagan Makeup. So um, again, to, to, the, to all of you, thank you so much indeed for, for your time today and for, for your insights. I'm going to share a couple of things that I've picked up from you um, myself. So um, start with you, Sinead. So Sinead said about the power of social media. It continues to grow and grow and grow. And it's something that has been immensely powerful in our own business and for many others. She says, influencer marketing is not going away. 
And she said to, it's really important to connect with the right influencer. Um, online, she created Irish Blogger Agency, which matches brands and influencers together uh, with a view to finding, as uh, she mentioned, she's uh, 800 influencers with a reach of over 8 million. I think I got those numbers right. There was two eights in it. Anyway, um, she says data is absolutely key. And she said, it's really important to find out where your audience is hanging out, whether that's TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. She particularly mentioned um, after we had a conversation about various different platforms, she said LinkedIn is really, really powerful. The cost of advertising is cheaper. And she said to pick two though, pick two and commit. She said, um, uh, just in, as of the end of last year, she said she needed somebody in her life that was external um, to help her with her business. And she has since tripled uh, her turnover in terms of how she's been working despite COVID. Um, she said the key point she wanted to make is that influencer marketing is not as scary as people think. There is a cost, but it's worth it. Then Aoife said, um, it's so important to engage with your audience. She posts everything that she does. She has the cutest little cottage in Adair. And since she is all about um, Irish heritage, it do dovetails right in. COVID, COVID directed her in a different way because she was supposed to be in a studio in Dublin, but it's all working out well. She spoke a lot about vision boards and you loved the fact that she spoke about vision boards. And um, she said she's a three page vision, dream big, crazy thoughts, no matter how big and then delve into the detail and manifest them, uh, manifest them in your head. She said it's very important to schedule time and get, get your, um, track your week, plan ahead, figure out what you're going to post and when. Uh, when asked the question, and it's a really important question, around what do you do uh, when you're giving your social media to other people, she said, the content is what she has created, the photos come from for Ireland that she has picked, she knows what's coming up, the vision and the content, and she decides from there. Then Charlene said, um, it's friendship at the end of the day. Uh, she said, it's, she, it, she was and is the woman on the other side of her social media content and, and feed. She does resonate with them. She said, authenticity is so important and people do see her as genuine. She doesn't just talk about foundation and just put it on, but it's about how it affects your skin, the best way to put it on, where it comes from, what the price is. It's all about education. She said, education is so important, but she kept on coming back over and over again to her own happiness. That is what ultimately drives the bus and that her business is built around making sure that that happens. She spoke about uh, being a makeup artist and then uh, doing uh, delivering courses in Facebook marketing. Things went hand in hand and then she just went for it. And again, uh, I won't refer to the phrase that she mentioned that everyone remembers now, but uh, she speaks about how Facebook video did go viral. She had only 5,000 followers, only, you know, she had only, only 5,000 followers at the time and the reach of the video reached 35,000. Um, and then she said, the key thing she thinks about when she puts something together is what is the follower going to get out of this? She also speaks about it's, it's important not to have all of your eggs in one, in one basket um, and that if social media was shut down tomorrow, what then? So she has a diversified nature. And she said, it's also about managing your time effectively. Um, she, does, she talks about taking the manual work out of your out of, out of your engagement with customers. For example, the autoresponder that she has and the link to her website where she captures all of the information and she thinks that way. So again, she can come back to making sure that happiness is at her core. Um, thank you so much indeed to each and every single one of you. You've been amazing. Um, we knew you would be, but really and truly as I capture and look at all the comments that's come on my screen and on Menti over here and on my comments that have come here and questions in here, um, you've really, really resonated with a lot of people. You've given a lot of value. Thank you to each and every one of you. And we wish you the very best sincerely in all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're very welcome, guys. And we'll, we'll, we're going to, going to see, you, uh, see you again soon. So now we are coming to the part where what I'm going to do now is that I have a great job ahead of me, which is that I'm going to introduce the various different people who are going to be pitching to us today. So what I'm going to do now is I am just going to um, make sure that I have everybody uh, okay, so I'm going to start off with um, bringing in, I'm going to ask Marina Murphy. Um, I'm just going to, uh, Marina, what I'm just going to ask you to do now is I'm going to ask you just to turn on your video and your mic. Uh, also, Niamh, I'm going to ask you to do the same. So I'm just going to give you uh, Make sure that you can do the same. Okay, so Niamh, uh, okay, Niamh, we're set up there. Um, Marina, so can I just ask you, uh, Marina, can I just make sure where you are? Um, just make sure now that you are here with me. 
Um, or maybe I need to, yep, yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna check there, Marina, if you could turn on your, uh, your video and your mic as well, please. Yeah, my video's on. Super? Yeah. Very good, perfect, perfect. And you can hear me, great. Yep, we can hear you. Yep, we can hear you very well. And we're just um, all going well now, just making sure that everything is okay there. Now, what I'm going to do at this stage is that I'm also going to ask afterwards, I'm going to ask Mary McKenna to comment. Uh, I'm going to ask Mary McKenna to comment on uh, each of the pitches as they come through. So uh, but just before I do, just to make sure we have everything up and running and that our, our pitchers have a chance to get uh, to get themselves uh, together and organized. Um, Anya says, really enjoying all the speakers. And Susan, you're doing an incredible job. So applause to you too. Thank you, Anya. You're very, very kind. Aoife said, fantastic event, so well organized and lots of insights being shared. Um, Anne says, excellent panel and speakers, expertly hosted by Susan. Thank you to all. This is the embarrassing part. I really am so humbled by your comments. When I'm reading them out, I feel I should be authentic and tell you what people are saying. And if you have negative stuff, don't worry, I'll read that out too. Um, Una says, thank you, Marie and Susan and all of the panelists. It's been a great morning and I've learned so much from all of these amazing ladies. So really great to see, guys. Um, that fabulous, thanks so much, says Rachel. Wonderful speakers, says Septa. Um, Mary says, Susan, you provide such comprehensive summaries. Well done, brilliant MC. Mary, it's a job I absolutely love to do. Truly, truly love to do. And I think it's so important. I know there's so much going on in all of your worlds and particularly when it's online, it's important that, that, we, get, that we get the key points across. So I now have, um, as I say, the great job of introducing our pitchers. Now I'm going to do a very, very short job of this. All I'm going to say is their name. I'm going to say their website. But after that, as I say, the power is in your hands. So I'm not going to say any more. At the end, I'm going to thank them. I'm going to go to, to Mary for a comment. And then I'm going to move on to the next picture. That's all I'm going to do. I do not want to influence anything whatsoever. So here's where my summarization is going to stop. And the power, as I say, is entirely in your hands. To remind you of the prize, a 750 uh, euro voucher sponsored by the Leo. There's also going to be mentoring from Grant Thornton. And um, so that's all I'm going to say that, as I mentioned, the power is in your hands. We still have over 100 people on the call who are going to decide who gets the prize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, Neve, we're going to start with you. I am going to move you into the spotlight, okay? And uh, you know, uh, the floor is yours. All I'm going to say is this is Neve Ryle, and that's all. That's all that I'm going to say. I'm going to hand it over to you now, Neve. And uh, the clock is ticking. You've got four minutes. So HomeCheck is a service provider uh, specialising in property surveys for home buyers. Um, my name is Neve, and I'm a qualified civil engineer. And prior to setting up HomeCheck, I had worked for over 15 years on large scale engineering projects. Like many, I'd been through the home buying process a few times with my family. And I felt that when it came to engineers and building surveyors, that I could provide a better service than what was available. Buying a house can be an incredibly frustrating process with too many stops and starts. Home Check's mission is to deliver our part of the process seamlessly and without contributing to delays. We are personable technical advisors in the property buying process. Structural reports are now a requirement of most mortgage providers and therefore I could see an increasing demand for our service. I developed a standardized comprehensive property check equivalent to an NCT for a house and targeted buyers by means of online advertising. Over half of HomeCheck's customers come to us via our mobile site and our customers include a high percentage of first-time buyers, overseas buyers, and people who've moved to Ireland from other countries. So here's how HomeCheck works. Clients input a quote request via our online platform or by phone, and they receive a prompt quote by email within two hours. When the quote is accepted, we arrange access to the property and complete a comprehensive review of the property. We aim to have the survey and report compiled within five business days. Unlike traditional survey reports, our home check report not only satisfies the technical needs of solicitors and lenders, it's primarily aimed at providing our client, the home buyer, with a clear picture of the construction and condition of the building and identifies the potential costs and risks associated with their purchase. Quality is paramount. So there are currently 50 to 60,000 property sales in Ireland per annum, and we estimate the total national spend on pre-purchase surveys to be of the order of 15 million. By the end of 2018, we had the capacity to deliver a service far beyond one woman engineer in Galway, and that's me. 
We road tested a few business models for expansion and settled on a unique partnership model based on tight alliances with engineers and surveyors in other areas. We divided the country into geographical units based on population, and we firstly extended to Limerick and Clare, then East County Galway, West Meath, and now into Mayo. We currently cover a geographical area from Kerry to Sligo and are actively looking for partners in Cork and the Midlands. Business partners are carefully selected to ensure that the Home Check brand retains the culture and high quality service that we pride ourselves on. The partnership model that we employ with our partners is simple and effective. Home Check sources and engages with customers through our targeted online cam advertising campaigns. Once a booking is received, we forward the relevant job details to our partner, who then carries out the survey using Home Check software and submits the report to our Home Check central system. The customer downloads and pays for the report in one go. We provide the back office, marketing and billing systems needed to bring our partners' businesses forward and partner, by partnering with Home Check, our partners are freed up to do what they do best, which is engineering work. We work on a revenue share business model and revenues are split with our partners at month end. We lean heavily on new technologies and minimize our running costs by in-house software development of our business management systems and our engineering reporting systems. And then combined with patience and, patience and diligence of our engineers, we provide an efficient and consistently high quality service. We will continue our expansion within Ireland with the aim of becoming a national go-to name for property buyers. I was a participant on the 2018 Empower programme, the first year of the course, and I was introduced to Maria Staunton and the iHub at that stage. And Maria continues to provide backup to me for which I'm very grateful. I would highly recommend that anyone starting out would apply for the Empower course. And then finally, just to wrap up, to say thank you to Brian Reynolds who gave me great time for, with the um, pitch. Thank you, everybody. Niamh, well done. Um, your business is homecheck.ie and thank you for taking up the opportunity because I know it isn't easy and I know particularly to, to, to go first. So the next person that I'm now going to go to is Assumpta Gallagher and uh, just like I did with, um, with Niamh, Assumpta, if you just turn on your sound, please. And yeah. I'm, the stage is yours. Hi hey everyone, um, not that long ago I checked in with a receptionist in the GP surgery. I was directed upstairs to meet the GP with whom I'd had a scheduled meeting, knocked on her door and when I entered this GP who I had previously only spoken to by phone, stood up to greet me and then burst into tears. The normal greeting would have been a handshake but after a short pause my instinct was to offer this clearly troubled GP a hug. Once we began to talk, she said that when I walked into her room, she felt a strong sense that I would provide the solutions to solve the many issues in her practice, and this is why she became so emotional. The stress and overwhelm had been building up for a long period of time. The issues were many. A practice manager who wasn't performing, lack of systems and processes for running the business side of the practice, and low staff morale. The overwhelm had come about as the GP had effectively taken on the practice management role on top of an already demanding workload, including patient care and all the associated admin. My name is Assumpta Gallagher and I'm the owner and founder of Best Practice, a consultancy and training business which was established in early 18 to help GPs deal with these types of issues and more. I work in several different ways, one-to-one -one with GPs and their staff, both in-house and remotely, providing general business consultancy services in the areas of practice management, business strategy, and HR. To date, to date I've delivered a variety of customized training to over 400 GPs, practice managers, and medical receptionists, through live workshops, online webinars, and remote training. Almost all of us have a GP, and like all medical professionals, they're generally patient-centered and their roles as business owners and employers, although important, are often secondary to this. With over 20 years experience, both as a manager and a business consultant, I have first-hand experience of the unique challenges that are associated with running a patient-centered business. I currently have a team of experts that I work with when I require specialized advice, such as in employment law, GDPR, or finance but my mission is to have a one-stop shop for GPs who wish to access a range of expertise to cover all aspects of running a successful and profitable business. 
When I carried out a full audit and review of the practice I referred to earlier, I discovered that they were losing out on thousands of euro every month. This was a combination of unclaimed state income and private patient income. The practice manager had received no formal training, which is why management tasks kept ending up on the GP's desk. Staff weren't being managed effectively, which resulted in lack of motivation and general low morale. Best practice put a training plan in place for the manager and staff, processes and systems were streamlined and key tasks were delegated to appropriate staff. I managed to recover just over 24,000 in unclaimed state income and unpaid accounts. Following a recent review, the practice team now have the tools to successfully implement their new systems and processes, which has resulted in a 15% increase in monthly income and the staff appear much more engaged and happier in their respective roles, having received appropriate support and training. HR challenges, along with unclaimed income, have been the common denominator in all 22 practices I have worked with to date, reclaimed amounts varying between four and a half and 37,000 euro. GPs benefit hugely from my experience as ultimately I help to remove the underlying stress and overwhelm, allowing them more time to be the doctors they want to be and patients then get the care that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Assumpta. And Assumpta is from bestpractice.ie. So again, keep your thoughts. We're going to be opening up the poll very shortly. And I'm going to ask Marina Murphy to introduce her business, which is babyboss dot, uh, babybossonline.com. Uh, and then I'm going to be going to Mary for a comment. And uh, then we'll be opening the poll for voting. Marina, stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Marina Murphy, and I'm a mum to Anna. I'm the founder of Baby Boss, and I'm the inventor of the patented two-part baby vest called the Toosie. I'm going to talk to you today about how we came up with the idea, how we validated the product and our plans to scale and bring new products on stream. Have you ever had to remove all of a baby's clothes to change a vest where only the part, bottom part is wet due to a leaky nappy? This can happen in a car, in the park, on your lap or somewhere with no changing facilities. Whether it's while out and about or even just at home in the middle of the night, the nappy is full and the bottom part of the vest is wet. To change the wet vest, you have to remove all of the baby's clothes. Well, not anymore. My light bulb moment came when my daughter Anna picked up a tummy book. The bottom part of her vest kept getting wet and she had to be changed four times in one hour. This meant I had to remove all her clothes each time. This was very stressful on Anna as she was very lethargic. In frustration, I searched online for something more practical but found nothing. This is when it hit me, the two-part baby vest, the Toosie. The unique selling point of the Toosie is that it is detachable. It's designed so you don't have to remove all your baby's clothes just to change a wet vest. It comes with one top and two bottom parts and the concept is patented. It's made from 100% organic cotton and all our packaging is 100% compostable. Did you know the baby clothing market is worth 135 billion. A small chunk of this market would mean a very sizable return. We sell the Tuzi primarily directly to customers through our website, babybossonline.com. We connect with customers mainly through Facebook and Instagram ads. And we've also featured on, the, on Ireland AM, the Irish Times, Mums and Tots, and the RSVP magazine. We have two key segments, parents, mostly mothers, and the gift market. We know people love the Tuzi and want it. We've already sold 1,000 units with a soft launch last November 2019 and very little marketing behind us. We've had over 110,000 people visit our website and could have easily sold another 1,000 Toosies if COVID hadn't caused delays in getting stock. However, we do have 3,000 vests arriving in the next few weeks. Based on our most recent order with our manufacturers, the Toosie will deliver a 68% gross margin and approximately 40% net profit. Now that we have validated the product and the fact that there is a market, the challenge is scaling up and becoming international. The Toosie has a range of other uses. For example, we've had parents purchase a Toosie for their sick children in hospital 
and children who are peg fed. We also intend to sell the Tuzi as a travel vest in airports. We've also developed a Tuzi for children and babies with special needs, autism and sensory issues. We have a range of other convenient product ideas, which unfortunately I can't go into in such a public forum. My background is culinary arts um, and I specialize in pastry. I ran and owned two restaurants, one in Dublin and one in Mayo. I also did some restaurant consultancy and was responsible for managing large culinary teams in Dublin. My partner Aidan is a solicitor and he specializes in sports law and data protection. In summary, the market for baby clothes is huge. The Tuzi is truly, truly innovative and we are the team to scale the Baby Boss brand into the global brand I passionately believe it can be. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Marina. And Marina is from babybossonline.com and I'm just going to change the video. Uh, okay, now, at this point, um, I am now going to bring in Mary. So Mary is just going to comment on each of the three um, and just to get your thoughts, Mary. And at that stage, please do get your thoughts together. Uh, all of you who are, who are now online with us, you will be voting um, very, very soon. And I'm just going to, Mary, let's, let's hear from you. Well, I was going to comment on all of the pictures at once, actually, Susan, if that was okay. Um, so I thought that they were accomplished and confident pictures from all three ladies and three very good businesses. Um, it's very, very hard to pitch comprehensively without slides. So uh, well done for the ladies that did that. It's not an easy thing to do. And I also thought it was very interesting that they are three businesses in which women can really excel as the founder. And uh, I think that that's a, a kind of an interesting twist there that, um, uh, and I would love to have conversations with all three of you about what you're doing. So well done, everybody. Great pictures. Thanks, Mary. And as always, um, inspiring words, uh, inspiring words. And I can tell you again from, from genuine experience that when Mary says that she will have a conversation with you, that is, that is, that is real. So the moment of truth, uh, the moment of truth indeed. So what I'm now going to do, um, okay, so again, three businesses. We had bestpractice.ie, homecheck.ie, babybossonline.com. So what I'm now going to do is that I'm now going to open the poll. Okay, so I'm just opening it up here on my screen. And the poll is called Cast Your Vote, okay? And I'm going to give you a minute. I'm, I'm simply going to talk just so you know that I'm still here, but I'm, I'm just going to give you a minute. And uh, also, just for complete transparency, none of the panelists can vote. That includes Mary, that includes me, that includes Maria. None of us can vote. The power is genuinely in your hands in three, two, one. Okay, so the poll is now open. And... Um, I can see how, how it's developing. Uh, I, we, uh, by God, you're voting fast. 40, 50, the 58% of you have voted. Oh, sorry, I'm very nervous for you here. Um, I'm, I, uh, so, uh, okay, things have changed a little bit now. 73% uh, of you have voted. And um, we are now 30 seconds in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am going to leave it for a minute because I said I would, despite the fact that I probably won't really need to. But 74% um, of you have voted. Uh, we have 40 seconds have gone. Um, uh, there's been a load of, of lovely comments in the comment section to say how well you all did. And um, uh, okay, so we have got eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm now ending the polling and here's the results. Uh, well done to bestpractice.ie with 48% uh, of the vote. Um, a, a sincere uh, well done, well done indeed, um, Asumta. You have won the prize of the 750 euro as well as uh, the mentoring from Grant Thornton. So you might maybe just, I'm going to put you back in the spotlight if you just want to say oh. anything to the people who have, who have cast their vote. Thank you um, so much. I'm actually quite emotional. Um, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really thrilled. Um, I'm so, so passionate about my business and I often think people don't really understand what I do, but I love what I do and I really genuinely enjoy helping the people, the clients that I help. 
So again, huge thanks to everybody. It's been a fantastic morning. Every second of it has been amazing. Speakers, the insights, everything. I have learned so much from it. Well done to the other two guys as well. They're both great businesses. Well done. Um, I already know about you guys anyway, obviously, because um, you are amazing. And uh, thanks again. Hugely appreciated. Well done. Well, well done in, in, indeed, indeed, Assumpta. And, uh, and absolutely to Marina and to Neve as well. Um, Marina, would you, just, would you just like to, uh, just to remind us of your, of your website, please? Uh, yeah, it's babybossonline.com. Thank you. Susan. Wonderful. Thank you. And similarly as well, Neve, if you could just unmute there for a moment and just remind us, please. So it's uh, homecheck.ie. Well done. Well done. It really is not an easy thing to do to, to pitch in that way. And there's floods and floods and floods of comments that are coming in here of, of people who are, who are congratulating you. Um, so at, at this point, I am going to bring in Sandra. So Sandra is just going to tell us all about the Empower Start program. And she just she's going, to, going to take us through that. Just before uh, we, we talk about that, I just want to, to very, very briefly, I would just want to say thanks a million to the guys at Clear Bookings because what they have done is they have enabled us to be able to run this event to capture all the bookings and send you out the emails, the confirmation emails, the reminder emails. So really, would just want to say a thanks to them. We have also an invite only evening uh, that's happening this evening and you are all heartily invited. We will be sending you out the details of that. Taking place tonight at seven o'clock, we have the fantastic uh, Nolan Blackwell from the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, who's going to talk about women finding their voice in a wide variety of scenarios. Uh, we're also going to have a surprise, a surprise for you where you will need rum, uh, fresh mint and brown sugar, saying nothing. And also we're going to have Dr. Uh, Claire Desbonet as well, who's going to talk about women in leadership. That's taking place tonight from 7 until 8.30 online. You're going to have more of me uh, and more of, uh, more of their fantastic speakers and a couple of other people as well. Now, um, and the very last thing I want to do is I just want to talk about the fact that it's so important to get really good advice. So many people have spoken about having mentors and getting, um, getting people to talk to who are in, it, who are in the way um, or in the space of advising you. Personally, I, I didn't know it before I heard Grant Thornton were sponsoring a um, piece of the prize, but I have gone to Grant Thornton myself in previous times um, when, actually, ironically, I'm finishing where we started with Mary McKenna, is when um, my business partner and I, for one of the businesses, um, when we set up, we went to them about the way in which to structure it so that it could allow people, if they were going to do more, they could be rewarded more, uh, tact-wise and otherwise, and just the benefit of getting the right advice is hugely, hugely beneficial. So, uh, so I know that that uh, assumption is going to benefit hugely, hugely from that. So, um, Sandra, can I ask you to please take the floor? I'm going to spotlight you here, and I am also just going to share the website over here, and you might just tell us a little bit about the Empower Start program. Okay, well, thank you, Suzanne. What a wonderful morning we've had. It's been great to hear from everybody. So, thank you for joining us. I really want to take the opportunity right now to remind anybody who doesn't already know that we have our applications open at the moment for our Empower Start program. Now, we run two programs on, on the Empower program. One is Start, and this is for anybody in early stage startup. We say up to about 18 months. And we also run Empower Growth, and this is for people who are established in business who want to scale and grow their business. So, as Maria mentioned earlier, we have had a huge response to the program. We've been, had the opportunity because the Department of Justice and Quality um, have given us the funds to run this second Empower program and to roll it out into, across six counties. So we're very fortunate to be able to include Donegal, Leitrim and Roscommon in Empower too. And we've been working now with the Sligo Innovation Centre and the CoLab in Letterkenny. So if you are motivated and if you have, are interested in a startup business and you want support, some support, you want some training, you want some business mentoring, and you want to benefit from the peer-to-peer -peer learning in this wonderful network that we have here in the West of Ireland, I'm going to invite you to apply for our Empower Start program. So as you can see there, you can register online on empowerher.ie. Now the closing date is this Friday, okay? So you only have a few days left to apply. And also if you're listening in today and you think, well, look, maybe this is not for me, I also invite you to share the word. So you may have a friend, you may have a neighbor, you may have another colleague who's been talking about setting up in business. If they want the support that we have to offer, please spread the word. And back to you, Suzanne. 
Perfect. Thank you so much indeed for that. Um, and I mean, it really is, it's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic opportunity. Um, so all that's left for me to do now is a couple of things. I want to read out a couple of more comments. Um, Mary said, as Susan mentioned earlier, I've recently lodged Awaken Hub with a few friends. Now this is all about um, female founders and finance. So people who are seeking to raise money, um, but also to be in an environment around people who want to go after the scale that the like of Eve McKenna spoke about, the way Lorraine has done so, the way our digital influencers are. So just wanted to mention that. Um, also, um, I just want to say that uh, we do need to thank sincerely the Department of, of Justice and Equality has really have, they are the reason that the Empower program uh, can happen and that uh, and with the help of the other sponsors can, can make sure that a day like today can happen. We'd also like to thank uh, Jeanette from the Sligo Innovation Centre and Patsy Colab in Letterkenny as well. Thanks so much for all that you've done. Um, Maria Staunton is currently on the chat and she's thanking so many people to, right across, across the area. So j just want to mention all of those as well. Um, I could not, I would be here for an hour if I was to, to read out all of the comments over the last while um, from people who have been saying about all of, all of what they've got out of the morning. So we, we, we want to certainly appreciate that as, uh, as well. Um, just to let you know again, the evening event is taking place tonight. You're all going to get an email about that. I'm going to be on the uh, empowerher.ie Facebook page in and about an hour and I'm going to read out all of my summaries. So you will get a chance to get the summaries of each of, of the speakers. I'm going to go on, I'm going to go on live and feel free if you have any comments, um, absolutely we'll, we'll happily take them and also we'll tag each of the speakers in there as well. Now, all that I've left to do is to say thank you so much for your tweets, for your participation, for being with us, for voting, for all of the things and all of the great environment that you've created. I cannot thank Sandra and Maria enough. They have been absolutely amazing to work with. Um, it has just been truly an amazing project to work on. I've been working with them now. Would you believe the first time I spoke to Maria was uh, when phase two opened and it was our first day back at the office. So we've been working on this for months and it's a true credit to both of them that today has gone like it's gone. So thank you to each and every one of you. Every best wish for an amazing week ahead and also in each and every single one of your businesses thanks to all of the panelists the speakers the participants everyone wish you all the very best and all going well we'll see you this evening thank you all and goodbye